And now we begin the ninth canto, chapter 1, King Sudyumna becomes a woman. King Pariksit said, My lord, Shukdev Goswami, you have elaborately described all the periods of the various Manus, and within those periods, the wonderful activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who has unlimited potency. I am fortunate to have heard all of this from you. Satyavrata, the saintly king of Dravida Desha, who received spiritual knowledge at the end of the last millennium by the grace of the Supreme, later became Vivasvata Manu, the son of Vivasvan, in the next Manvantara, or period of Manu. I have received this knowledge from you. I also understand that such kings as Ikshvaku were his sons, as you have already explained. O greatly fortunate Shukdev Goswami, O great Brahman, kindly describe to us separately the dynasties and characteristics of all those kings, for we are always eager to hear such topics from you. Kindly tell us about the abilities of all the celebrated kings born in the dynasty of Vivasvata Manu, including those who have already passed, those who may appear in the future, and those who exist at present. Sutta Goswami said, When Shukdev Goswami, the greatest knower of religious principles, was thus requested by Maharaj Pariksit in the assembly of all the scholars learned in Vedic knowledge, he then proceeded to speak. Shukdev Goswami continued, O King, subduer of your enemies, now hear from me in great detail about the dynasty of Manu. I shall explain as much as possible, although one could not say everything about it, even in hundreds of years. The transcendental supreme person, the supersoul of all living entities, who are in different statuses of life, high and low, existed at the end of the millennium, when neither this manifested cosmos nor anything else but him existed. O King Pariksit, from the navel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead was generated a golden lotus on which the four-faced Lord Brahma took his birth. From the mind of Lord Brahma, Marichi took birth. And from the semen of Marichi, Kashyapa appeared from the womb of the daughter of Daksha Maharaj. From Kashyapa, by the womb of Aditi, Vivasvan took birth. O King, best of the Bharat dynasty, from Vivasvan, by the womb of Samgya, Shraddha Manu was born. Shraddha Manu, having conquered his senses, begot ten sons in the womb of his wife, Shraddha. The names of these sons were Ikshvaku, Nriga, Shayati, Dishta, Drishta, Karushika, Narashyanta, Kshadra, Nabaga and Kavi. Manu at first had no sons. Therefore, in order to get a son for him, the great saint Vasishta, who was very powerful in spiritual knowledge, performed a sacrifice to satisfy the demigods Mitra and Varuna. During that sacrifice, Shraddha, Manu's wife, who was observing the vow of subsisting only by drinking milk, approached the priest offering the sacrifice, offered obeisances to him, and begged for a daughter. Told by the chief priest, now offer oblations, the person in charge of oblations took clarified butter to offer. He then remembered the request of Manu's wife and performed the sacrifice while chanting the word, Vashat. Manu had begun that sacrifice for the sake of getting a son, but because the priest was diverted by the request of Manu's wife, a daughter named Elah was born. Upon seeing the daughter, Manu was not very satisfied. Thus he spoke to his guru, Vasishta, as follows. My lord, all of you are expert in chanting the Vedic mantras. How then has the result been opposite to the one desired? This is a matter for lamentation. There should not have been such a reversal of the results of the Vedic mantras. You are all self-controlled, well-balanced in mind, and aware of the absolute truth. And because of austerities and penances, you are completely cleansed of all material contamination. Your words, like those of the demigods, are never baffled. 
then how is it possible that your determination has failed? The most powerful great-grandfather, Vasishta, after hearing these words of Manu, understood the discrepancy on the part of the priest. Thus he spoke as follows to the son of the sun god. This discrepancy in the objective is due to your priest's deviation from the original purpose. However, by my own prowess, I shall give you a good son. O King Parikshit, after the most famous and powerful Vasishta made this decision, he offered prayers to the Supreme Person, Vishnu, to transform Ilah into a male. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Controller, being pleased with Vasishta, gave him the benediction he desired. Thus Ilah was transformed into a very fine male named Sudyumna. O King Parikshit, that hero Sudyumna, accompanied by a few ministers and associates, and riding on a horse brought from Sindhu Pradesha, once went into the forest to hunt. He wore armor and was decorated with bows and arrows, and he was very beautiful. While following the animals and killing them, he reached the northern part of the forest. There in the north, at the bottom of Mount Meru, is a forest known as Sukumara, where Lord Shiva always enjoys with Uma. Sudyumna entered that forest. O King Pariksit, as soon as Sudyumna, who was expert in subduing enemies, entered the forest, he saw himself transformed into a female and his horse transformed into a mare. When his followers also saw their identities transformed and their sex reversed, they were all very morose and just looked at one another. Maharaj Pariksit said, O most powerful Brahman, why was this place so empowered, and who made it so powerful? Kindly answer this question, for I am very eager to hear about this. Great saintly persons who strictly observed the spiritual rules and regulations, and whose own effulgence dissipated all the darkness of all directions, once came to see Lord Shiva in that forest. When the goddess Ambika saw the great saintly persons, she was very much ashamed, because at that time she was naked. She immediately got up from the lap of her husband and tried to cover her breast. Seeing Lord Shiva and Parvati engaged in sexual affairs, all the great saintly persons immediately desisted from going further and departed for the ashram of Nara Narayan. Thereupon, just to please his wife, Lord Shiva said, Any male entering this place shall immediately become a female. Since that time, no male had entered that forest. But now King Sudyumna, having been transformed into a female, began to walk with his associates from one forest to another. Sudyumna had been transformed into the best of beautiful women, who excite sexual desire, and was surrounded by other women. Upon seeing this beautiful woman loitering near his ashram, Buddha, the son of the moon, immediately desired to enjoy her. The beautiful woman also desired to accept Buddha, the son of the king of the moon, as her husband. Thus Buddha begot in her womb a son named Puru Riva. I heard from reliable sources that King Sudyumna, the son of Manu, having thus achieved femininity, remembered his familial spiritual master, Vasishta. Upon seeing Sudyumna's deplorable condition, Vasishta was very much aggrieved. Desiring for Sudyumna to regain his maleness, Vasishta again began to worship Lord Shankara or Shiva. O King Pariksit, Lord Shiva was pleased with Vasishta. Therefore, to satisfy him and to keep his own word to Parvati, Lord Shiva said to that saintly person, Your disciple Sudyumna may remain a male for one month and a female for the next. In this way, he may rule the world as he likes. Thus being favored by the spiritual master, according to the words of Lord Shiva, Sudyumna regained his desired maleness every alternate month and in this way ruled the kingdom, although the citizens were not satisfied with this. O King, Sudyumna had three very pious sons named Utkala, Gaya, and Vimala, who became the kings of the Dakshina Pata. 
Thereafter, when the time was ripe, when Sudyumna, the king of the world, was sufficiently old, he delivered the entire kingdom to his son Pururava and entered the forest. Thus ends the first chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, King Sudyumna Becomes a Woman. And now chapter 2, The Dynasties of the Sons of Manu. Shukdev Goswami said, Thereafter, when his son Sudyumna had thus gone to the forest to accept the order of Vanaprastha, Vaivaspada Manu, or Shraddha being desirous of getting more sons, performed severe austerities on the bank of the Yamuna for one hundred years. Then, because of this desire for sons, the Manu known as Shraddha Deva worshipped the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead, the Lord of the Demigods. Thus he got ten sons exactly like himself. Among them all, Ikshvaku was the eldest. Among these sons, Prashadra, following the order of his spiritual master, was engaged as a protector of cows. He would stand all night with a sword to give the cows protection. Once at night, while it was raining, a tiger entered the land of the cowshed. Upon seeing the tiger, all the cows, who were lying down, got up in fear and scattered here and there on the land. When the very strong tiger seized the cow, the cow screamed in distress and fear, and Prashadra, hearing the screaming, immediately followed the sound. He took up his sword, but because the stars were covered by clouds, he mistook the cow for the tiger and mistakenly cut off the cow's head with great force. Because the tiger's ear had been cut by the edge of the sword, the tiger was very afraid, and it fled from that place while bleeding on the street. In the morning, when Prashadra, who was quite able to subdue his enemy, saw that he had killed the cow, although at night he thought he had killed the tiger, he was very unhappy. Although Prashadra had committed the sin unknowingly, his family priest, Vasishta, cursed him, saying, In your next life you shall not be able to become a Kshatriya. Instead, you shall take birth as a Shudra because of killing the cow. When the hero Prashadra was thus cursed by his spiritual master, he accepted the curse with folded hands. Then, having controlled his senses, he took the vow of Brahmacharya, which is approved by all great sages. Thereafter, Prashadra gained relief from all responsibilities, became peaceful in mind, and established control over all his senses. Being unaffected by material conditions, being pleased with whatever was available by the grace of the Lord to maintain body and soul together, and being equal toward everyone, he gave full attention to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, who is the transcendental Supersoul, free from material contamination. Thus Prashadra, fully satisfied in pure knowledge, always keeping his mind on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, achieved pure devotional service to the Lord and began traveling all over the world without affection for material activities, as if he were deaf, dumb, and blind. With this attitude, Prashadra became a great saint, and when he entered the forest and saw a blazing forest fire, he took this opportunity to burn his body in the fire. Thus he achieved the transcendental, spiritual world. Being reluctant to accept material enjoyment, Manu's youngest son, whose name was Kavi, gave up the kingdom before attaining full youth. Accompanied by his friends, he went to the forest, always thinking of the self-effulgent, supreme personality of Godhead within the core of his heart. Thus he attained perfection. From Kurusha, Another son of Manu came the Karusha dynasty, a family of Kshatriyas. The Karusha Kshatriyas were the kings of the northern direction. They were celebrated protectors of Brahminical culture and were all firmly religious. From the son of Manu named Drishta came a Kshatriya caste called Darshta, whose members achieved the position of Brahmins in this world. Then from the son of Manu named Nriga came Sumati, from Sumati came Bhutajyoti, and from Bhutajyoti came Vasu. 
The son of Vasu was Pratika, whose son was Ogavan. Ogavan's son was also known as Ogavan, and his daughter was Ogavati. Sudarshan married that daughter. From Narashanta came a son named Chitrasena, and from him a son named Riksha. From Riksha came Midavan, from Midavan came Purna, and from Purna came Indrasena. From Indrasena came Vitihotra, from Vitihotra came Satyashrava, from Satyashrava came the son named Urushrava, and from Urushrava came Devadatta. From Devadatta came a son known as Agnivesha, who was the fire god Agni himself. This son, who was a celebrated saint, was well known as Kanina and Jatukarnya. O king, from Agnivesha came a Brahminical dynasty known as Agnivesyayana. Now that I have described the descendants of Narashanta, let me describe the descendants of Dishta. Please hear from me. Dishta had a son by the name Nabaga. This Nabaga, who was different from the Nabaga described later, became a Vaishya by occupational duty. The son of Nabaga was known as Balandana. The son of Balandana was Vatsapriti, and his son was Pramshu. Pramshu's son was Pramati. Pramati's son was Kanitra. Kanitra's son was Chakshusha, and his son was Vivamshati. The son of Vivamshati was Ramba, whose son was the great and religious king Kaninetra. O king, the son of Kaninetra was King Karandama. From Karandama came a son named Avikshit, and from Avikshit a son named Maruta, who was the emperor. The great mystic Samvarta, the son of Angira, engaged Maruta in performing a sacrifice. The sacrificial paraphernalia of King Maruta was extremely beautiful, for everything was made of gold. Indeed, no other sacrifice could compare to his. In that sacrifice, King Indra became intoxicated by drinking a large quantity of Soma Ras. The Brahmins received ample contributions, and therefore they were satisfied. For that sacrifice, the various demigods who control the winds offered foodstuffs, and the Vishvadevas were members of the assembly. Maruta's son was Dhamma. Dhamma's son was Rajavardhana. Rajavardhana's son was Sudriti, and his son was Nara. The son of Nara was Kevala, and his son was Danduman, whose son was Vegavan. Vegavan's son was Buddha, and Buddha's son was Trinabindu, who became the king of this earth. The best of the Apsaras, the highly qualified girl named Alambusha, accepted the similarly qualified Trinabindu as her husband. She gave birth to a few sons and a daughter known as Ilavila. After the great saint Vishrava, the master of mystic yoga, received absolute knowledge from his father, he begot in the womb of Ilavila the greatly celebrated son known as Kuvera, the giver of money. Trinabindu had three sons named Vishala, Shunyabandhu, and Dumraketu. Among these three, Vishala created a dynasty and constructed a palace called Vaishali. The son of Vishala was known as Hemachandra. His son was Dumraksha, and his son was Samyama, whose sons were Devaja and Krishashva. The son of Krishashva was Somadatta, who performed Ashvamedha sacrifices and thus satisfied the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu. By worshipping the Supreme Lord, he achieved the most exalted post, a residence on the planet to which great mystic yogis are elevated. The son of Somadatta was Sumati, whose son was Janamejaya. All these kings appearing in the dynasty of Vishala properly maintained the celebrated position of King Trinabindu.
Thus ends the second chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Dynasties of the Sons of Manu. And now chapter 3, The Marriage of Sukanya and Chayavana Muni. Sri Shukdev Goswami continued, O King, Sharyati, another son of Manu, was a ruler completely aware of Vedic knowledge. He gave instructions about the functions for the second day of the yajna to be performed by the descendants of Angira. Sharyati had a beautiful lotus-eyed daughter named Sukanya, with whom he went to the forest to see the ashram of Chayavana Muni. While that Sukanya, surrounded by her friends, was collecting various types of fruits from the trees in the forest, she saw within the hole of an earthworm two things glowing like luminaries. As if induced by providence, the girl ignorantly pierced those two glowworms with a thorn, and when they were pierced, blood began to ooze out of them. Thereupon all the soldiers of Sharyati were immediately obstructed from passing urine and stool. Upon perceiving this, Sharyati spoke to his associates in surprise. He said, how strange it is that one of us has attempted to do something wrong to Chayavna Muni, the son of Brigu. It certainly appears that someone among us has polluted this ashram. Being very much afraid, the girl Sukanya said to her father, I have done something wrong, for I have ignorantly pierced these two luminous substances with a thorn. After hearing this statement by his daughter, King Sharyati was very much afraid. In various ways, he tried to appease Chayavna Muni, for it was he who sat within the hole of the earthworm. King Sharyati, being very contemplative and thus understanding Chayavna Muni's purpose, gave his daughter in charity to the sage. Thus released from danger with great difficulty, he took permission from Chayavna Muni and returned home. Chayavna Muni was very irritable, but since Sukanya had gotten him as her husband, she dealt with him carefully, according to his mood. Knowing his mind, she performed service to him without being bewildered. Thereafter, some time having passed, the Ashvini Kumara brothers, the heavenly physicians, happened to come to Chayavana Muni's ashram. After offering them respectful obeisances, Chayavana Muni requested them to give him youthful life, for they were able to do so. Chayavana Muni said, Although you are ineligible to drink Somaras in sacrifices, I promise to give you a full pot of it. Kindly arrange beauty and youth for me, because they are attractive to young women. The great physicians, the Ashvini Kumaras, very gladly accepted Chayavana Muni's proposal. Thus they told the Brahmin, Just dive into this lake of successful life. One who bathes in this lake has his desires fulfilled. After saying this, the Ashvini Kumaras caught hold of Chayavana Muni, who was an old, diseased invalid with loose skin, white hair, and veins visible all over his body, and all three of them entered the lake. Thereafter, three men with very beautiful bodily features emerged from the lake. They were nicely dressed and decorated with earrings and garlands of lotuses. All of them were of the same standard of beauty. The chaste and very beautiful Sukanya could not distinguish her husband from the two Ashvini Kumaras, for they were equally beautiful. Not understanding who her real husband was, she took shelter of the Ashvini Kumaras. The Ashvini Kumaras were very pleased to see Sukanya's chastity and faithfulness. Thus they showed her Chayavana Muni, her husband, and after taking permission from him, they returned to the heavenly planets in their plane. Thereafter, King Sharyati, desiring to perform a sacrifice, went to the residence of Chayavana Muni. There he saw by the side of his daughter a very beautiful young man, as bright as the sun. After receiving obeisances from his daughter, the king, instead of offering blessings to her, appeared very displeased and spoke as follows. O oh, unchaste girl, what is this that you have desired to do? You have cheated the most respectable husband, who is honored by everyone, for I see that because he was old, diseased, and therefore unattractive, you have left his company to accept as your husband this, this young man who appears to be a beggar from the street. 
Oh, my daughter, who were born in a respectable family, how have you degraded your consciousness in this way? How is it that you are shamelessly maintaining a, a paramour? You will thus degrade the dynasties of both your father and your husband to hellish life. Sukanya, however, being very proud of her chastity, smiled upon hearing the rebukes of her father. She smilingly told him, My dear father, this young man by my side is your actual son-in-law, the great sage Chayavana, who was born in the family of Brigu. Thus Sukanya explained how her husband had received the beautiful body of a young man. When the king heard this, he was very surprised, and in great pleasure he embraced his beloved daughter. Chayavana Muni, by his own prowess, enabled King Sharyati to perform the Soma Yagya. The Muni offered a full pot of Soma Ras to the Ashvini Kumaras, although they were unfit to drink it. King Indra, being perturbed and angry, wanted to kill Chayavana Muni, and therefore he impetuously took up his thunderbolt. But Chayavana Muni, by his powers, paralyzed Indra's arm that held the thunderbolt. Although the Ashvini Kumaras were only physicians and were therefore excluded from drinking Somaras and sacrifices, the demigods agreed to allow them henceforward to drink it. King Sharyati begot three sons named Utanabari, Anarta, and Burishena. From Anarta came a son named Revata. O Maharaj Pariksit, subduer of enemies, this Revata constructed a kingdom known as Kushastali in the depths of the ocean. There he lived and ruled such tracts of land as Anarta, etc. He had one hundred very nice sons, of whom the eldest was Kakudmi. Taking his own daughter, Revati, Kakudmi went to Lord Brahma in Brahmaloka, which is transcendental to the three modes of material nature, and inquired about a husband for her. When Kakudmi arrived there, Lord Brahma was engaged in hearing musical performances by the Gandharvas and had not a moment to talk with him. Therefore Kakudmi waited, and at the end of the musical performances he offered his obeisances to Lord Brahma and thus submitted his long-standing desire. After hearing his words, Lord Brahma, who is most powerful, laughed loudly and said to Kakudmi, <laughs> o king, all those whom you may have decided within the core of your heart to accept as your son-in-law have passed away in the course of time. Twenty-seven Chatur Yugas have already passed. Those upon whom you may have decided are now gone, and so are their sons, grandsons, and other descendants. You cannot even hear about their names. O king, Leave here and offer your daughter to Lord Baladev, who is still present. He is most powerful. Indeed, he is the supreme personality of Godhead, whose plenary portion is Lord Vishnu. Your daughter is fit to be given to him in charity. Lord Baladev is the supreme personality of Godhead. One who hears and chants about him is purified. Because he is always the well-wisher of all living entities, he has descended with all his paraphernalia to purify the entire world and lessen its burden. Having received this order from Lord Brahma, Kakudmi offered obeisances unto him and returned to his own residence. He then saw that his residence was vacant, having been abandoned by his brothers and other relatives who were living in all directions because of fear of such higher living beings as the Yakshas. Thereafter the king gave his most beautiful daughter in charity to the supremely powerful Baladev and then retired from worldly life and went to Badarik Ashram to please Nara Narayan. Thus ends the third chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Marriage of Sukanya and Chayavana Muni. And now chapter 4. Ambarish Maharaj offended by Durvasa Muni. Shukdev Goswami said, The son of Nabaga, named Nabaga, lived for a long time at the place of his spiritual master. Therefore his brothers thought that he was not going to become a grahasta and would not return. Consequently, without providing a share for him, they divided the property of their father among themselves. When Nabaga returned from the place of his spiritual master, 
they gave him their father as his share. Nabaga inquired, My dear brothers, what have you given my share of our elder brothers answered, We have kept our father as your share. But when Nabaga went to his father and said, My dear father, my elder brothers have given you as my share of property, the father replied, My dear son, do not rely upon their cheating words. I am not your property. All the descendants of Angira are now going to perform a great sacrifice, but although they are very intelligent, on every sixth day they will be bewildered in performing sacrifice and will make mistakes in their daily duties. Go to those great souls and describe two Vedic hymns pertaining to Vaishvadeva. When the great sages have completed the sacrifice and are going to the heavenly planets, they will give you the remnants of the money they have received from the sacrifice. Therefore, go there immediately. Thus, Nabaga acted exactly according to the advice of his father, and the great sages of the Angira dynasty gave him all their wealth and then went to the heavenly planets. Thereafter, while Nabaga was accepting the riches, a black-looking person from the north came to him and said, all the wealth from this sacrificial arena belongs to me. Nabaga then said, No, these riches belong to me. The great saintly persons have delivered them to me. When Nabaga said this, the black-looking person replied, Let us go to your father and ask him to settle our disagreement. In accordance with this, Nabaga inquired from his father. The father of Nabaga said, Whatever the great sages sacrificed in the arena of the Daksha Yagya, they offered to Lord Shiva as his share. Therefore, everything in the sacrificial arena certainly belongs to Lord Shiva. Thereupon, after offering obeisances to Lord Shiva, Nabaga said, O worshipable Lord, everything in this arena of sacrifice is yours. This is the assertion of my father. Now with great respect, I bow my head before you, begging your mercy. Lord Shiva said, Whatever your father has said is the truth, and you also are speaking the same truth. Therefore I, who know the Vedic mantras, shall explain transcendental knowledge to you. Now you may take all the wealth remaining from the sacrifice, for I give it to you. After saying this, Lord Shiva, who is most adherent to the religious principles, disappeared from that place. If one hears and chants or remembers this narration in the morning and evening with great attention, he certainly becomes learned, experienced in understanding the Vedic hymns, and expert in self-realization. From Nabaga, Maharaj Ambarish took birth. Maharaj Ambarish was an exalted devotee, celebrated for his great merits. Although he was cursed by an infallible Brahmin, the curse could not touch him. O oh, great personality, Maharaj Ambarish was certainly most exalted and meritorious in character. I wish to hear about him. How surprising it is that the curse of a Brahmin, which is insurmountable, could not act upon him. Maharaj Ambarish, the most fortunate personality, achieved the rule of the entire world, consisting of seven islands and achieved inexhaustible, unlimited opulence and prosperity on earth. Although such a position is rarely obtained, Maharaj Ambarish did not care for it at all, for he knew very well that all such opulence is material. Like that which is imagined in a dream, such opulence will ultimately be destroyed. The king knew that any non-devotee who attains such opulence merges increasingly into material nature's mode of darkness. Maharaj Ambarish was a great devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, and of the saintly persons who are the Lord's devotees. Because of this devotion, he thought of the entire universe as being as insignificant as a piece of stone. Maharaj Ambarish always engaged his mind in meditating upon the lotus feet of Krishna, his words in describing the glories of the Lord, his hands in cleansing the Lord's temple, and his ears in hearing the words spoken by Krishna or about Krishna. He engaged his eyes in seeing the deity of Krishna, Krishna's temples and Krishna's places, like Mathura and Vrindavan. 
he engaged his sense of touch in touching the bodies of the Lord's devotees. He engaged his sense of smell in smelling the fragrance of Tulsi offered to the Lord. And he engaged his tongue in tasting the Lord's prasad. He engaged his legs in walking to the holy places and temples of the Lord, his head in bowing down before the Lord, and all his desires in serving the Lord twenty-four hours a day. Indeed, Maharaj Ambarish never desired anything for his own sense gratification. He engaged all his senses in devotional service in various engagements related to the Lord. This is the way to increase attachment for the Lord and be completely free from all material desires. In performing his prescribed duties as king, Maharaj Ambarish always offered the results of his royal activities to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, who is the enjoyer of everything and is beyond the perception of material senses. He certainly took advice from Brahmins who were faithful devotees of the Lord, and thus he ruled the planet Earth without difficulty. In desert countries where there flowed the river Sarasvati, Maharaj Ambarish performed great sacrifices like the Ashvamedha Yagya, and thus satisfied the master of all Yagyas, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such sacrifices were performed with great opulence and suitable paraphernalia and with contributions of Dakshina to the Brahmins who were supervised by great personalities like Vasishta, Asita and Gotama, representing the king, the performer of the sacrifices. In the sacrifice arranged by Maharaj Ambarish, the members of the assembly and the priests, especially Hota, Udgata, Brahma and Advaryu, were gorgeously dressed and they all looked exactly like demigods. They eagerly saw to the proper performance of the yajna. The citizens of the state of Maharaj Ambarish were accustomed to chanting and hearing about the glorious activities of the Personality of Godhead. Thus they never aspired to be elevated to the heavenly planets, which are extremely dear even to the demigods. Those who are saturated with the transcendental happiness of rendering service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead are uninterested even in the achievements of great mystics, for such achievements do not enhance the transcendental bliss felt by a devotee who always thinks of Krishna within the core of his heart. The king of this planet, Maharaj Ambarish, thus performed devotional service to the Lord and in this endeavor practiced severe austerity, always satisfying the Supreme Personality of Godhead by his constitutional activities, he gradually gave up all material desires. Maharaj Ambudish gave up all attachment to household affairs, wives, children, friends and relatives, to the best of powerful elephants, to beautiful chariots, carts, horses and inexhaustible jewels, and to ornaments, garments, and an inexhaustible treasury. He gave up attachment to all of them, regarding them as temporary and material. Being very pleased by the unalloyed devotion of Maharaj Ambarish, the Supreme Personality of Godhead gave the king his disc, which is fearful to enemies and which always protects the devotee from enemies and adversities. To worship Lord Krishna, Maharaj Ambarish, along with his queen, who is equally qualified, observed the vow of Ekadashi and Dvarishi for one year. In the month of Kartik, after observing that vow for one year, after observing a fast for three nights, and after bathing in the Yamuna, Maharaj Ambarish worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari in Maruvan. Following the regulative principles of Mahabhisheka, Maharaj Ambarish performed the bathing ceremony for the deity of Lord Krishna with all paraphernalia, and then he dressed the deity with fine clothing, ornaments, fragrant flower garlands, and other paraphernalia for worship of the Lord. With attention and devotion, he worshipped Krishna and all the greatly fortunate Brahmins who were free from material desires. 
Thereafter, Maharaj Ambarish satisfied all the guests who arrived at his house, especially the Brahmins. He gave in charity sixty crores of cows whose horns were covered with gold plate and whose hooves were covered with silver plate. All the cows were well decorated with garments and had full milk bags. They were mild-natured, young and beautiful, and were accompanied by their calves. After giving these cows, the king first sumptuously fed all the Brahmins, and when they were fully satisfied, he was about to observe the end of Ekadashi, with their permission, by breaking the fast. Exactly at that time, however, Durvasa Muni, the great and powerful mystic, appeared on the scene as an uninvited guest. After standing up to receive Durvasa Muni, King Ambarish offered him a seat and paraphernalia of worship. Then, sitting at his feet, the king requested the great sage to eat. Durvasa Muni gladly accepted the request of Maharaj Ambarish. But to perform the regulative ritualistic ceremonies, he went to the river Yamuna. There, he dipped into the water of the auspicious Yamuna and meditated upon the impersonal Brahman. In the meantime, only a mohurta, or half a moment, of the Dvarishi day was left on which to break the fast. Consequently, it was imperative that the fast be broken immediately. In this dangerous situation, the king consulted learned Brahmins. The king said, To transgress the laws of respectful behavior toward the Brahmins is certainly a great offense. On the other hand, if one does not observe the breaking of the fast within the time of Vadashi, there is a flaw in one's observance of the vow. Therefore, O Brahmins, if you think that it will be auspicious and not irreligious, I shall break the fast by drinking water. In this way, after consulting with the Brahmins, the king reached this decision, for according to Brahminical opinion, drinking water may be accepted as eating and also as not eating. O best of the Kuru dynasty, after he drank some water, King Ambarish, meditating upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead within his heart, waited for the return of the great mystic Durvasa Muni. After executing the ritualistic ceremonies to be performed at noon, Durvasa returned from the bank of the Yamuna. The king received him well, offering all respects. But Durvasa Muni, by his mystic power, could understand that King Ambarish had drunk water without his permission. Still hungry, Durvasa Muni, his body trembling, his face curved and his eyebrows crooked in a frown, angrily spoke as follows to King Ambarish, who stood before him with folded hands. Alas, just see the behavior of this cruel man. He is not a devotee of Lord Vishnu. Being proud of his material opulence and his position, he considers himself God. Just see how he has transgressed the laws of religion. Maharaj Ambarish, you have invited me to eat as a guest, but instead of feeding me, you yourself have eaten first. Because of your misbehavior, I shall show you something to punish you. As Durvasa Muni said this, his face became red with anger. Uprooting a bunch of hair from his head, he created a demon resembling the blazing fire of devastation to punish Maharaj Ambarish. Taking a trident in his hand and making the surface of the earth tremble with his footsteps, that blazing creature came before Maharaj Ambarish. But the king, upon seeing him, was not at all disturbed and did not move even slightly from his position. As fire in the forest immediately burns to ashes an angry snake, so by the previous order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his disk, the Sudarshan Chakra, immediately burnt to ashes the created demon to protect the Lord's devotee. Upon seeing that his own attempt had failed, and that the Sudarshan Chakra was moving toward him, Durvasa Muni became very frightened and began to run in all directions to save his life. As the blazing flames of a forest fire pursue a snake, the disk of the Supreme Personality of Godhead began following Durvasa Muni. 
Dravasamuni saw that the disc was almost touching his back, and thus he ran very swiftly, desiring to enter a cave of Sumeru Mountain. Just to protect himself, Dravasamuni fled everywhere, in all directions, in the sky, on the surface of the earth, in caves, in the ocean, on different planets of the rulers of the three worlds, and even on the heavenly planets. But wherever he went, he immediately saw following him the unbearable fire of the Sudarshan Chakra. With a fearful heart, Durvasamuni went here and there seeking shelter. But when he could find no shelter, he finally approached Lord Brahma and said, Oh, my Lord! Oh, Lord Brahma! Kindly protect me from the blazing Sudarshan Chakra sent by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. At the end of the Dvi Paradha, when the pastimes of the Lord come to an end, Lord Vishnu, by a flick of his eyebrows, vanquishes the entire universe, including our places of residence. Such personalities as me and Lord Shiva, as well as Daksha, Bhrigu, and similar great saints, of which they are the head, and also the rulers of the living entities, the rulers of human society, and the rulers of the demigods, all of us surrender to that supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, bowing our heads to carry out his orders for the benefit of all living entities. When Durvasa, who was greatly afflicted by the blazing fire of a Sudarshan Chakra, was thus refused by Lord Brahma, he tried to take shelter of Lord Shiva, who always resides on his planet known as Kailasa. Lord Shiva said, My dear son, I, Lord Brahma, and the other demigods who rotate within this universe under the misconception of our greatness, cannot exhibit any power to compete with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For innumerable universes and their inhabitants come into existence and are annihilated by the simple direction of the Lord. Past, present, and future are known to me, Sanat Kumara, Narad, the most revered Lord Brahma, Kapila, the son of Devahuti, Apantaratama, or Lord Vyasdev, Devala, Yamaraj, Asuri, Marichi, and many saintly persons headed by him, as well as many others who have achieved perfection. Nonetheless, because we are covered by the illusory energy of the Lord, we cannot understand how expansive that illusory energy is. You should simply approach that Supreme Personality of Godhead to get relief, for this Sudarshan Chakra is intolerable even to us. Go to Lord Vishnu. He will certainly be kind enough to bestow all good fortune upon you. Thereafter, being disappointed even in taking shelter of Lord Shiva, Durvasa Muni went to Vaikuntha Dham, where the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, resides with his consort, the Goddess of Fortune. Durvasamuni, the great mystic, scorched by the heat of the Sudarshan Chakra, fell at the lotus feet of Narayan. His body trembling, he spoke as follows. O oh, infallible, unlimited Lord, protector of the entire universe, you are the only desirable objective for all devotees. I am a great offender, my Lord. Please give me protection. O oh, my Lord, O oh, Supreme Controller, without knowledge of your unlimited prowess, I have offended your most dear devotee. Very kindly save me from the reaction of this offense. You can do everything, for even if a person is fit for going to hell, you can deliver him simply by awakening within his heart the holy name of your Lordship. I am completely under the control of my devotees. Indeed, I am not at all independent. Because my devotees are completely devoid of material desires, I sit only within the cores of their hearts. What to speak of my devotee? Even those who are devotees of my devotee are very dear to me. O oh, best of the Brahmins, without saintly persons for whom I am the only destination, I do not desire to enjoy my transcendental bliss and my supreme opulences. Since pure devotees give up their homes, wives, children, relatives, riches, and even their lives simply to serve me without any desire for material improvement in this life or in the next, how can I give up such devotees at any time? 
As chaste women bring their gentle husbands under control by service, the pure devotees, who are equal to everyone and completely attached to me in the core of the heart, bring me under their full control. My devotees, who are always satisfied to be engaged in my loving service, are not interested even in the four principles of liberation, Salokya, Sarupya, Samipya, and Sarshti, although these are automatically achieved by their service. What then is to be said of such perishable happiness as elevation to the higher planetary systems? The pure devotee is always within the core of my heart, and I am always in the heart of the pure devotee. My devotees do not know anything else but me, and I do not know anyone else but them. O Brahman, let me now advise you for your own protection. Please hear from me. By offending Maharaj Ambarish, you have acted with self-envy. Therefore, you should go to him immediately without a moment's delay. One so-called prowess, when employed against a devotee, certainly harms he who employs it. Thus it is the subject, not the object, who is harmed. For a Brahmin, austerity and learning are certainly auspicious, but when acquired by a person who is not gentle, such austerity and learning are most dangerous. O best of the Brahmins, you should therefore go immediately to King Ambarish, the son of Maharaj Nabaga. I wish you all good fortune. If you can satisfy Maharaj Ambarish, then there will be peace for you. Thus ends the fourth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Ambarish Maharaj Offended by Durvasa Muni. And now chapter five, Durvasa Muni's Life Spared. Shukdev Goswami said, When thus advised by Lord Vishnu, Durvasa Muni, who was very much harassed by the Sudarshan Chakra, immediately approached Maharaj Ambarish. Being very much aggrieved, the Muni fell down and clasped the king's lotus feet. When Durvasa touched his lotus feet, Maharaj Ambarish was very much ashamed. And when he saw Devasa attempting to offer prayers, because of mercy, he was aggrieved even more. Thus he immediately began offering prayers to the great weapon of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Maharaj Ambarish said, O Sudarshan Chakra, you are fire, you are the most powerful sun, and you are the moon, the master of all luminaries. You are water, earth, and sky. You are the air, you are the five sense objects, sound, touch, form, taste, and smell, and you are the senses also. O most favorite of Achutya, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you have thousands of spokes. O master of the material world, destroyer of all weapons, original vision of the Personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Kindly give shelter and be auspicious to this Brahmin. O Sudarshan Wheel, you are religion, you are truth, you are encouraging statements, you are sacrifice, and you are the enjoyer of the fruits of sacrifice. You are the maintainer of the entire universe, and you are the supreme transcendental prowess in the hands of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You are the original vision of the Lord, and therefore you are known as Sudarshan. Everything has been created by your activities, and therefore you are all-pervading. O Sudarshan, you have a very auspicious hub, and therefore you are the upholder of all religion. You are just like an inauspicious comet for the irreligious demons. Indeed, you are the maintainer of the three worlds. You are full of transcendental effulgence. You are as quick as the mind, and you are able to work wonders. I can simply utter the word Nama, offering all obeisances unto you. O Master of Speech, by your effulgence, full of religious principles, the darkness of the world is dissipated, and the knowledge of learned persons or great souls is manifested. Indeed, no one can surpass your effulgence, for all things, manifested and unmanifested, gross and subtle, superior and inferior, are but various forms of you that are manifested by your effulgence. 
O indefatigable one, when you are sent by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to enter among the soldiers of the Daityas and the Danavas, you stay on the battlefield and unendingly separate their arms, bellies, thighs, legs, and heads. O protector of the universe, you are engaged by the Supreme Personality of Godhead as his all-powerful weapon in killing the envious enemies. For the benefit of our entire dynasty, kindly favor this poor Brahmin. This will certainly be a favor for all of us. If our family has given charity to the proper persons, if we have performed ritualistic ceremonies and sacrifices, if we have properly carried out our occupational duties, and if we have been guided by learned Brahmins, I wish, in exchange, that this Brahmin be freed from the burning caused by the Sudarshan Chakra. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is one without a second, who is the reservoir of all transcendental qualities, and who is the life and soul of all living entities, is pleased with us, we wish that this Brahman, Durvasa Muni, be freed from the pain of being burned. When the king offered prayers to the Sudarshan Chakra and Lord Vishnu, because of his prayers, the Sudarshan Chakra became peaceful and stopped burning the Brahman known as Durvasa Muni. Durvasa Muni, the greatly powerful mystic, was indeed satisfied when freed from the fire of the Sudarshan Chakra. Thus he praised the qualities of Maharaj Ambarish and offered him the highest benedictions. Durvasa Muni said, My dear king, today I have experienced the greatness of devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for although I have committed an offense, you have prayed for my good fortune. For those who have achieved the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the master of the pure devotees, what is impossible to do and what is impossible to give up? What is impossible for the servants of the Lord? By the very hearing of his holy name one is purified. O king, overlooking my offenses, you have saved my life. Thus I am very much obliged to you because you are so merciful. Expecting the return of Durvasa Muni, the king had not taken his food. Therefore, when the sage returned, the king fell at his lotus feet, pleasing him in all respects, and fed him sumptuously. Thus the king respectfully received Durvasa Muni, who after eating varieties of palatable food, was so satisfied that with great affection he requested the king to eat also, saying, Please take your meal. I am very pleased with you, my dear king. At first I thought of you as an ordinary human being and accepted your hospitality. But later I could understand by my own intelligence that you are the most exalted devotee of the Lord. Therefore, simply by seeing you, touching your feet, and talking with you, I have been pleased and have become obliged to you. All the blessed women in the heavenly planets will continuously chant about your spotless character at every moment, and the people of this world will also chant your glories continuously. Thus being satisfied in all respects, the great mystic yogi Durvasa took permission and left, continuously glorifying the king. Through the skyways he went to Brahmaloka, which is devoid of agnostics and dry philosophical speculators. Durvasa Muni had left the place of Maharaj Ambarish, and as long as he had not returned for one complete year, the king had fasted, maintaining himself simply by drinking water. After one year, when Durvasa Muni had returned, King Ambarish sumptuously fed him all varieties of pure food, and then he himself also ate. When the king saw that the Brahmin Durvasa had been released from the great danger of being burned, he could understand that by the grace of the Lord he himself was also powerful, but he did not take any credit for everything had been done by the Lord. In this way, because of devotional service, Maharaj Ambarish, who was endowed with varieties of transcendental qualities, was completely aware of Brahman, Paramatma, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and thus he executed devotional service perfectly.
Because of his devotion, he thought even the topmost planet of this material world no better than the hellish planets. Thereafter, because of his advanced position in devotional life, Maharaj Ambarish, who no longer desired to live with material things, retired from active family life. He divided his property among his sons, who were equally as qualified, and he himself took the order of Vanaprastha and went to the forest to concentrate his mind fully upon Lord Vasudev. Anyone who chants this narration or even thinks of this narration about the activities of Maharaj Ambarish certainly becomes a pure devotee of the Lord. By the grace of the Lord, those who hear about the activities of Maharaj Ambarish, the great devotee, certainly become liberated or become devotees without delay. Thus ends the fifth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Durvasamuni's Life Spared. And now chapter six, the downfall of Sobri Muni. O Maharaj Pariksit, Ambarish had three sons named Virupa, Ketuman, and Shambhu. From Virupa came a son named Prashadashva, and from Prashadashva came a son named Ratitara. Ratitara had no sons, and therefore he requested the great sage Angira to beget sons for him. Because of this request, Angira begot sons in the womb of Ratitara's wife. All these sons were born with Brahminical prowess. Having been born from the womb of Ratitara's wife, all these sons were known as the dynasty of Ratitara. But because they were born from the semen of Angira, they were also known as the dynasty of Angira. Among all the progeny of Ratitara, these sons were the most prominent because, owing to their birth, they were considered Brahmins. The son of Manu was Ikshvaku. When Manu was sneezing, Ikshvaku was born from Manu's nostrils. King Ikshvaku had one hundred sons, of whom Vikukshi, Nimi, and Dandaka were the most prominent. Of the one hundred sons, Twenty-five became kings in the western side of Aryavarta, a place between the Himalaya and Vindhya mountains. Another twenty-five sons became kings in the east of Aryavarta, and the three principal sons became kings in the middle. The other sons became kings in various other places. During the months of January, February, and March, Oblations offered to the forefathers are called Ashtaka Shraddha. The Shraddha ceremony is held during the dark fortnight of the month. When Maharaj Ikshvaku was performing his oblations in this ceremony, he ordered his son Vikukshi to go immediately to the forest to bring some pure flesh. Thereafter, Ikshvaku's son Vikukshi went to the forest and killed many animals suitable for being offered as oblations. But when fatigued and hungry, he became forgetful and ate a rabbit he had killed. The Kukshi offered the remnants of the flesh to King Ikshvaku, who gave it to Vasishta for purification. But Vasishta could immediately understand that part of the flesh had already been taken by the Kukshi, and therefore he said that it was unfit to be used in the Shraddha ceremony. When King Ikshvaku Thus informed by Vasishta, understood what his son Vikukshi had done, he was extremely angry. Thus he ordered Vikukshi to leave the country because Vikukshi had violated the regulative principles. Having been instructed by the great and learned Brahmin Vasishta, who discoursed about the absolute truth, Maharaj Ikshvaku became renounced. By following the principles for a yogi, he certainly achieved the supreme perfection after giving up his material body. After his father's disappearance, Vikukshi returned to the country and thus became the king, ruling the planet Earth and performing various sacrifices to satisfy the supreme personality of Godhead. Vikukshi later became celebrated as Shashada. The son of Shashada was Puranjaya, who was also known as Indravaha, and sometimes as Kukutsta. Please hear from me how he received different names for different activities. 
Formerly, there was a devastating war between the demigods and the demons. The demigods, having been defeated, accepted Puranjaya as their assistant and then conquered the demons. Therefore, this hero is known as Puranjaya, he who conquered the residents of the demons. Puranjaya agreed to kill all the demons on the condition that Indra would be his carrier. Because of pride, Indra could not accept this proposal, but later, by the order of the Supreme Lord, Vishnu, Indra did accept it and became a great bull carrier for Puranjaya. Well protected by armor and desiring to fight, Puranjaya took up a transcendental bow and very sharp arrows, and while being highly praised by the demigods, he got up on the back of the bull, or Indra, and sat on its hump. Thus he is known as Kakutsta. Being empowered by Lord Vishnu, who is the Supersoul and the Supreme Person, Puranjaya sat on the great bull and is therefore known as Indra Baha. Surrounded by the demigods, he attacked the residents of the demons in the west. There was a fierce battle between the demons and Puranjaya. Indeed, it was so fierce that when one hears about it, one's hairs stand on end. All the demons bold enough to come before Puranjaya were immediately sent to the residents of Yamaraj by his arrows. To save themselves from the blazing arrows of Indravaha, which resembled the flames of devastation at the end of the millennium, the demons who remained when the rest of their army was killed fled very quickly to their respective homes. After conquering the enemy, the saintly king Puranjaya gave everything, including the enemy's riches and wives, to Indra, who carries a thunderbolt. For this he is celebrated as Puranjaya. Thus Puranjaya is known by different names because of his different activities. The son of Puranjaya was known as Anena. Anena's son was Prithu, and Prithu's son was Vishvagandhi. Vishvagandhi's son was Chandra, and Chandra's son was Yuvanashva. The son of Yuvanashva was Shravasta, who constructed a township known as Shravasti Puri. The son of Shravasta was Brihadashva, and his son was Kuvalayashva. In this way the dynasty increased. To satisfy the sage Utanka, the greatly powerful Kuvalayashva killed a demon named Dundu. He did this with the assistance of his 21,000 sons. O Maharaj Pariksit, for this reason Kuvalayashva is celebrated as Dundumara, the killer of Dundu. All but three of his sons, however, were burned to ashes by the fire emanating from Dundu's mouth. The remaining sons were Dridashva, Kapalashva, and Badrashva. From Dridashva came a son named Haryashva, whose son is celebrated as Nukumba. The son of Nikumba was Bahulashva. The son of Bahulashva was Krishashva. The son of Krishashva was Sainajit. And the son of Sainajit was Yuvanashva. Yuvanashva had no sons, and thus he retired from family life and went to the forest. Although Yuvanashva went into the forest with his one hundred wives, all of them were very morose. The sages in the forest, however, being very kind to the king, began very carefully and attentively performing an Indra Yagya so that the king might have a son. Being thirsty one night, the king entered the arena of sacrifice, and when he saw all the Brahmins lying down, he personally drank the sanctified water meant to be drunk by his wife. When the Brahmins got up from bed and saw the water pot empty, they inquired who had done this work of drinking the water meant for begetting a child. When the Brahmins came to understand that the king, inspired by the supreme controller, had drunk the water, they all exclaimed, Alas, the power of providence is real power. No one can counteract the power of the supreme. In this way, they offered their respectful obeisances unto the Lord.
Thereafter, in due course of time, a son, with all the good symptoms of a powerful king, came forth from the lower right side of King Yuvanashva's abdomen. The baby cried so much for breast milk that all the Brahmins were very unhappy. Who will take care of this baby, they said. Then Indra, who was worshipped in that yajna, came and solaced the baby. Do not cry, Indra said. Then Indra put his index finger in the baby's mouth and said, You may drink me. Because Yuvanashva, the father of the baby, was blessed by the Brahmins, he did not fall a victim to death. After this incident, he performed severe austerities and achieved perfection in that very spot. Mandata, the son of Yuvanashva, was the cause of fear for Ravan and other thieves and rogues who caused anxiety. O King Pariksit, because they feared him, the son of Yuvanashva was known as Trasadasyu. This name was given by King Indra. By the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the son of Yuvanashva was so powerful that when he became emperor, he ruled the entire world, consisting of seven islands without any second ruler. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is not different from the auspicious aspects of great sacrifices, such as the ingredients of the sacrifice, the chanting of Vedic hymns, the regulative principles, the performer, the priests, the result of the sacrifice, the arena of sacrifice, and the time of sacrifice. Knowing the principles of self-realization, Mandata worshipped that transcendentally situated Supreme Soul, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, who comprises all the demigods. He also gave immense charity to the Brahmins, and thus he performed yajna to worship the Lord. All places from where the sun rises on the horizon, shining brilliantly, to where the sun sets, are known as the possession of the celebrated Mandata, the son of Yuvanashva. Mandata begot three sons in the womb of Bindu Mati, the daughter of Shasha Bindu. These sons were Purukutsa, Ambarish, and Muchukunda, a great mystic yogi. These three brothers had fifty sisters, who all accepted the great sage Sobhadi as their husband. Sobhadi Rishi was engaged in austerity deep in the water of the river Yamuna when he saw a pair of fish engaged in sexual affairs. Thus he perceived the pleasure of sex life, and induced by this desire, he went to King Mandata and begged for one of the king's daughters. In response to this request, the king said, O Brahman, any of my daughters may accept any husband according to her personal selection. Sobhari Muni thought, I am now feeble because of old age. My hair has become gray, my skin is slack, and my head always trembles. Besides, I am a yogi. Therefore, women do not like me. Since the king has thus rejected me, I shall reform my body in such a way as to be desirable even to celestial women, what to speak of the daughters of worldly kings. Thereafter, when Sobhari Muni became quite a young and beautiful person, the messenger of the palace took him inside the residential quarters of the princesses, which were extremely opulent. All fifty princesses then accepted him as their husband, although he was only one man. Thereafter, the princesses, being attracted by Sobhari Muni, gave up their sisterly relationship and quarreled among themselves, each one of them contending, This man is just suitable for me and not for you. In this way, there ensued a great disagreement. Because Sobhari Muni was expert in chanting mantras perfectly, his severe austerities resulted in an opulent home with garments, ornaments, properly dressed and decorated maidservants and manservants, and varieties of parks with clear water lakes and gardens. In the gardens, fragrant with varieties of flowers, birds chirped and bees hummed, surrounded by professional singers. Sobhari Muni's home was amply provided with valuable beds, seats, ornaments, and arrangements for bathing, and there were varieties of sandalwood creams, flower garlands, and palatable dishes. 
Thus surrounded by opulent paraphernalia, the Muni engaged in family affairs with his numerous wives. Mandata, the king of the entire world, consisting of seven islands, was struck with wonder when he saw the household opulence of Sobri Muni. Thus he gave up his false prestige in his position as emperor of the world. In this way Sobri Muni enjoyed sense gratification in the material world, but he was not at all satisfied, just as a fire never ceases blazing if constantly supplied with drops of fat. Thereafter, one day while Sobri Muni, who was expert in chanting mantras, was sitting in a secluded place, he thought to himself about the cause of his fall-down, which was simply that he had associated himself with the sexual affairs of the fish. He said, Alas, while practicing austerity, even within the depths of the water, and while observing all the rules and regulations practiced by saintly persons, I lost the results of my long austerities simply by association with the sexual affairs of fish. Everyone should observe this fall down and learn from it. A person desiring liberation from material bondage must give up the association of persons interested in sex life and should not employ his senses externally in seeing, hearing, talking, walking and so on. One should always stay in a secluded place, completely fixing his mind at the lotus feet of the unlimited personality of Godhead. And if one wants any association at all, he should associate with persons similarly engaged. In the beginning, I was alone and engaged in performing the austerities of mystic yoga. But later, because of the association of fish engaged in sex, I desired to marry. Then I became the husband of fifty wives, and in each of them I begot one hundred sons, and thus my family increased to five thousand members. By the influence of the modes of material nature, I became fallen and thought that I would be happy in material life. Thus there is no end to my material desires for enjoyment in this life and in the next. In this way, he passed his life in household affairs for some time, but then he became detached from material enjoyment. To renounce material association, he accepted the Vanaprastha order and went to the forest. His devoted wives followed him, for they had no shelter other than their husband. When Sobri Muni, who was quite conversant with the self, went to the forest, he performed severe penances. In this way, in the fire at the time of death, he ultimately engaged himself in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. O Maharaj Puriksit, by observing their husband progressing in spiritual existence, Sobri Muni's wives were also able to enter the spiritual world by his spiritual power, just as the flames of a fire cease when the fire is extinguished. Thus ends the sixth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Downfall of Sobri Muni. And now chapter 7, The Descendants of King Mandata. Shukdev Goswami said, The most prominent among the sons of Mandata was he who is celebrated as Ambarish. Ambarish was accepted as son by his grandfather Yuvanashva. Ambarish's son was Yovanashva, and Yovanashva's son was Harita. In Mandata's dynasty, Ambarish, Harita, and Yovanashva were very prominent. The serpent brothers of Narmada gave Narmada to Purukutsa. Being sent by Vasuki, she took Purukutsa to the lower region of the universe. There in Rasatala, the lower region of the universe, Purukutsa, being empowered by Lord Vishnu, was able to kill all the Gandharvas who deserved to be killed. Purukutsa received the benediction from the serpents that anyone who remembers this history of his being brought by Narmada to the lower region of the universe will be assured of safety from the attack of snakes. The son of Purukutsa 
was Trasadasyu, who was the father of Anaranya. Anaranya's son was Haryashva, the father of Praruna. Praruna was the father of Tribandana. The son of Tribandana was Satyavrata, who was celebrated by the name Trishanku. Because he kidnapped the daughter of a Brahmin when she was being married, his father cursed him to become a Chandala, lower than a Shudra. Thereafter, by the influence of Vishvamitra, he went to the higher planetary system, the heavenly planets, in his material body. But because of the prowess of the demigods, he fell back downward. Nonetheless, by the power of Vishvamitra, he did not fall all the way down. Even today, he can still be seen hanging in the sky, head downward. The son of Trishanku was Harish Chandra. Because of Harish Chandra, there was a quarrel between Vishvamitra and Vasishta, who for many years fought one another, having been transformed into birds. Harish Chandra had no son and was therefore extremely morose. Once, therefore, following the advice of Narad, he took shelter of Varuna and said to him, My lord, I have no son. Would you kindly give me one? O King Pariksit, Haris Chandra begged Varuna, My lord, if a son is born to me, with that son I shall perform a sacrifice for your satisfaction. When Harish Chandra said this, Varuna replied, Let it be so. Because of Varuna's benediction, Harish Chandra begot a son named Rohita. Thereafter, when the child was born, Varuna approached Harish Chandra and said, Now you have a son. With this son you can offer me a sacrifice. In answer to this, Harish Chandra said, After ten days have passed since an animal's birth, the animal becomes fit to be sacrificed. After ten days, Varuna came again and said to Harish Chandra, Now you can perform the sacrifice. Harish Chandra replied, When an animal grows teeth, then it becomes pure enough to be sacrificed. When the teeth grew, Varuna came and said to Harish Chandra, Now the animal has grown teeth, and you can perform the sacrifice. Harish Chandra replied, When all its teeth have fallen out, then it will be fit for sacrifice. When the teeth had fallen out, Varuna returned and said to Harish Chandra, Now the animal's teeth have fallen out, and you can perform the sacrifice. But Harish Chandra replied, When the animal's teeth grow in again, then he will be pure enough to be sacrificed. When the teeth grew in again, Varuna came and said to Harish Chandra, Now you can perform the sacrifice. But Harish Chandra then said, O king, when the sacrificial animal becomes a kshatriya and is able to shield himself to fight with the enemy, then he will be purified. Harish Chandra was certainly very much attached to his son. Because of this affection, he asked the demigod Varuna to wait. Thus Varuna waited and waited for the time to come. Rohita could understand that his father intended to offer him as the animal for sacrifice. Therefore, just to save himself from death, he equipped himself with bow and arrows and went to the forest. When Rohita heard that his father had been attacked by dropsy due to Varuna and that his abdomen had grown very large, he wanted to return to the capital, but King Indra forbade him to do so. King Indra advised Rohita to travel to different pilgrimage sites and holy places, for such activities are pious indeed. Following this instruction, Rohita went to the forest for one year. In this way, at the end of the second, third, fourth, and fifth years, when Rohita wanted to return to his capital, the king of heaven, Indra, approached him as an old Brahmin and forbade him to return, repeating the same words as in the previous year. Thereafter, in the sixth year, after wandering in the forest, Rohita returned to the capital of his father. He purchased from Ajigarta his second son, named Shunashepa. Then he offered Shunashepa to his father, Harishchandra, to be used as the sacrificial animal, and offered Harishchandra his respectful obeisances.
Thereafter, the famous King Harish Chandra, one of the exalted persons in history, performed grand sacrifices by sacrificing a man and pleased all the demigods. In this way, his dropsy, created by Varuna, was cured. In that great human sacrifice, Vishvamitra was the chief priest to offer oblations. The perfectly self-realized Jamadagni had the responsibility for chanting the mantras from the Yajurveda. Vasishta was the chief Brahminical priest, and the sage Ayasya was the reciter of the hymns of the Sam Veda. King Indra, being very pleased with Harish Chandra, offered him a gift of a golden chariot. Soon Ashepa's glories will be presented along with the description of the son of Vishvamitra. The great sage Vishvamitra saw that Maharaj Harish Chandra, along with his wife, was truthful, forbearing, and concerned with the essence. Thus he gave them imperishable knowledge for fulfillment of the human mission. Maharaj Harish Chandra first purified his mind, which was full of material enjoyment, by amalgamating it with the earth. Then he amalgamated the earth with water, the water with fire, the fire with the air, and the air with the sky. Thereafter, he amalgamated the sky with the total material energy, and the total material energy with spiritual knowledge. This spiritual knowledge is realization of one's self as part of the Supreme Lord. When the self-realized spiritual soul is engaged in service to the Lord, he is eternally imperceptible and inconceivable. Thus established in spiritual knowledge, he is completely freed from material bondage. Thus ends the seventh chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Descendants of King Mandata. And now chapter 8, The Sons of Sagara Meet Lord Kapiladev. Shukdev Goswami continued, The son of Rohita was Harita, and Harita's son was Champa, who constructed the town of Champapuri. The son of Champa was Sudeva, and his son was Vijaya. The son of Vijaya was Baruka. Baruka's son was Vrika, and Vrika's son was Bahuka. The enemies of King Bahuka took away all his possessions, and therefore the king entered the order of Vanaprastha and went to the forest with his wife. Bahuka died when he was old, and one of his wives wanted to die with him, following the Sati rite. At that time, however, O Ramuni, knowing her to be pregnant, forbade her to die. Knowing that she was pregnant, the co-wives of the wife of Bahuka conspired to give her poison with her food, but it did not act. Instead, the son was born along with the poison. Therefore, he became famous as Sagara, which means one who is born with poison. Sagara later became the emperor. The place known as Ganga Sagara was excavated by his sons. Sagara Maharaj, following the order of his spiritual master, Orva, did not kill the uncivilized men like the Talajangas, Yavanas, Shakas, Haihayas, and Barbaras. Instead, some of them he made dress awkwardly. Some of them he shaved clean but allowed to wear mustaches. Some of them he left wearing loose hair. Some he half shaved. Some he left without underwear. And some without external garments. Thus these different clans were made to dress differently. But King Sagara did not kill them. Following the instructions of the great sage Orva, Sagara Maharaj performed Ashvamedha sacrifices and thus satisfied the Supreme Lord, who is the Supreme Controller, the Supersoul of all learned scholars, and the knower of all Vedic knowledge, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But Indra, the King of Heaven, stole the horse meant to be offered at the sacrifice. King Sagara had two wives, Sumati and Keshini. The sons of Sumati, who were very proud of their prowess and influence, following the order of their father, searched for the lost horse, 
While doing so, they dug into the earth very extensively. Thereafter, in the northeastern direction, they saw the horse near the ashram of Kapila Muni. Here is the man who has stolen the horse, they said. He is staying there with closed eyes. Certainly he is very sinful. Kill him! Kill him! Shouting like this, the sons of Sagara, sixty thousand altogether, raised their weapons. When they approached the sage, the sage opened his eyes. By the influence of Indra, the king of heaven, the sons of Sagara had lost their intelligence and disrespected a great personality. Consequently, fire emanated from their own bodies and they were immediately burned to ashes. It is sometimes argued that the sons of King Sagara were burned to ashes by the fire emanating from the eyes of Kapila Muni. This statement, however, is not approved by great learned persons, for Kapila Muni's body is completely in the mode of goodness, and therefore cannot manifest the mode of ignorance in the form of anger, just as the pure sky cannot be polluted by the dust of the earth. Kapila Muni enunciated in this material world the Sankhya philosophy, which is a strong boat with which to cross over the ocean of nescience. Indeed, a person eager to cross the ocean of the material world may take shelter of this philosophy. In such a greatly learned person, situated on the elevated platform of transcendence, how can there be any distinction between enemy and friend? Among the sons of Sagara Maharaj was one named Asamangjasa, who was born from the king's second wife, Keshini. The son of Asamangjasa was known as Amshuman, and he was always engaged in working for the good of Sagara Maharaj, his grandfather. Formerly, in his previous birth, Asamangjasa had been a great mystic yogi, but by bad association he had fallen from his exalted position. Now, in this life, he was born in a royal family and was a Jati Smada. That is, he had the special advantage of being able to remember his past birth. Nonetheless, he wanted to display himself as a miscreant, and therefore he would do things that were abominable in the eyes of the public and unfavorable to his relatives. He would disturb the boys sporting in the river Sarayu by throwing them into the depths of the water. Because Asamangjasa engaged in such abominable activities, his father gave up affection for him and had him exiled. Then Asamangjasa exhibited his mystic power by reviving the boys and showing them to the king and their parents. After this, Asamangjasa left Ayodhya. O King Pariksit, when all the inhabitants of Ayodhya saw that their boys had come back to life, they were astounded and King Sagara greatly lamented the absence of his son. Thereafter, Amshuman, the grandson of Maharaj Sagara, was ordered by the king to search for the horse. Following the same path traversed by his uncles, Amshuman gradually reached the stack of ashes and found the horse nearby. The great Amshuman saw the sage named Kapila, the saint who is an incarnation of Vishnu, sitting there by the horse. Amshuman offered him respectful obeisances, folded his hands, and offered him prayers with great attention. Amshuman said, My Lord, even Lord Brahma is to this very day unable to understand your position, which is far beyond himself, either by meditation or by mental speculation. So what to speak of others like us, who have been created by Brahma in various forms as demigods, animals, human beings, birds and beasts? We are completely in ignorance. Therefore, how can we know you, who are the transcendents? My Lord, you are fully situated in everyone's heart, but the living entities, covered by the material body, cannot see you, for they are influenced by the external energy conducted by the three modes of material nature. Their intelligence being covered by sattva guna, rajoguna, and tamoguna, they can see only the actions and reactions of these three modes of material nature. Because of the actions and reactions of the mode of ignorance, whether the living entities are awake or sleeping, they can see only the workings of material nature. 
they cannot see your lordship. O my lord, sages freed from the influence of the three modes of material nature, sages such as the four Kumaras, Sanat, Sanaka, Sanandana, and Sanatana, are able to think of you, who are concentrated knowledge. But how can an ignorant person like me think of you? O completely peaceful Lord, although material nature, fruit of activities, and their consequent material names and forms are your creation, you are unaffected by them. Therefore your transcendental name is different from material names, and your form is different from material forms. You assume a form resembling a material body just to give us instructions, like those of Bhagavad Gita, but actually you are the supreme original person. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O my Lord, those whose hearts are bewildered by the influence of lust, greed, envy, and illusion are interested only in false hearth and home in this world created by your maya. Attached to home, wife, and children, they wander in this material world perpetually. O super-soul of all living entities, O personality of Godhead, simply by seeing you I have now been freed from all lusty desires, which are the root cause of insurmountable illusion and bondage in the material world. O King Pariksit, when Amshuman had glorified the Lord in this way, the great sage Kapila, the powerful incarnation of Vishnu, being very merciful to him, explained to him the path of knowledge. The personality of Godhead said, My dear Amshuman, here is the animal sought by your grandfather for sacrifice. Please take it. As for your forefathers, who have been burnt to ashes, they can be delivered only by Ganges water, and not by any other means. Thereafter, Amshuman circumambulated Kapila Muni and offered him respectful obeisances, bowing his head. After fully satisfying him in this way, Amshuman brought back the horse meant for sacrifice, and with this horse, Maharaj Sagara performed the remaining ritualistic ceremonies. After delivering charge of his kingdom to Amshuman, and thus being freed from all material anxiety and bondage, Sagara Maharaj, following the means instructed by Orvamuni, achieved the supreme destination. Thus ends the eighth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Sons of Sagara Meet Lord Kapiladev. And now chapter nine, the dynasty of Amshuman. Shukdev Goswami continued. King Amshuman, like his grandfather, performed austerities for a very long time. Nonetheless, he could not bring the Ganges to this material world, and thereafter, in due course of time, he died. Like Amshuman himself, Dilipa, his son, was unable to bring the Ganges to this material world, and he also became a victim of death in due course of time. Then Dilipa's son, Bhagidatta, performed very severe austerities to bring the Ganges to this material world. Thereafter, Mother Ganges appeared before King Bhagidatta and said, I am very much satisfied with your austerities and am now prepared to give you benedictions as you desire. Being thus addressed by Ganga Devi, Mother Ganges, the king bowed his head before her and explained his desire. Mother Ganges replied, When I fall from the sky to the surface of the planet Earth, the water will certainly be very forceful. Who will sustain that force? If I am not sustained, I shall pierce the surface of the Earth and go down to Rasatala, the Patala area of the universe. O King, I do not wish to go down to the planet Earth, for there the people in general will bathe in my water to cleanse themselves of the reactions of their sinful deeds. When all these sinful reactions accumulate in me, how shall I become free from them? You must consider this very carefully. Bhagiratta said, Those who are saintly because of devotional service and are therefore in the renounced order, free from material desires, and who are pure devotees, expert in following the regulative principles mentioned in the Vedas, are always glorious and pure in behavior, and are able to deliver all fallen souls. When such pure devotees bathe in your water, 
the sinful reactions accumulated from other people will certainly be counteracted. For such devotees always keep in the core of their hearts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who can vanquish all sinful reactions. Like a cloth woven of threads extending for its length and breadth, this entire universe, in all its latitude and longitude, is situated under different potencies of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Shiva is the incarnation of the Lord, and thus he represents the Supersoul in the embodied soul. He can sustain your forceful waves on his head. After saying this, Bhagirata satisfied Lord Shiva by performing austerities. O King Pariksit, Lord Shiva was very quickly satisfied with Bhagirata. When King Bhagirata approached Lord Shiva and requested him to sustain the forceful waves of the Ganges, Lord Shiva accepted the proposal by saying, Let it be so. Then with great attention he sustained the Ganges on his head, for the water of the Ganges is purifying, having emanated from the toes of Lord Vishnu. The great and saintly king Bhagirata brought the Ganges, which can deliver all the fallen souls, to that place on earth where the bodies of his forefathers lay burnt to ashes. Bhagirata mounted a swift chariot and drove before Mother Ganges, who followed him, purifying many countries until they reached the ashes of Bhagirata's forefathers, the sons of Sagara, who were thus sprinkled with water from the Ganges. Because the sons of Sagara Maharaj had offended a great personality, the heat of their bodies had increased and they were burnt to ashes. But simply by being sprinkled with water from the Ganges, all of them became eligible to go to the heavenly planets. What then is to be said of those who use the water of Mother Ganges to worship her? Simply by having water from the Ganges come in contact with the ashes of their burnt bodies, the sons of Sagara Maharaj were elevated to the heavenly planets. Therefore, what is to be said of a devotee who worships Mother Ganges faithfully with a determined vow? One can only imagine the benefit that accrues to such a devotee. Because Mother Ganges emanates from the lotus toe of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Anantadev, she is able to liberate one from material bondage. Therefore, whatever is described herewith about her is not at all wonderful. Great sages, completely freed from material lusty desires, devote their minds fully to the service of the Lord. Such persons are liberated from material bondage without difficulty, and they become transcendentally situated, acquiring the spiritual quality of the Lord. This is the glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Bhagirata had a son named Shruta, whose son was Naba. This son was different from the Naba previously described. Naba had a son named Sindhudvipa. From Sindhudvipa came Ayutayu, and from Ayutayu came Rituparna, who became a friend of Nalaraj. Rituparna taught Nalaraj the art of gambling, and Nalaraj gave Rituparna lessons in controlling and maintaining horses. The son of Rituparna was Sarvakama. Sarvakama had a son named Sudasa, whose son, known as Sodasa, was the husband of Damayanti. Sodasa is sometimes known as Mitra Saha or Kalma Shapada. Because of his own misdeed, Mitra Saha was sonless and was cursed by Vasishta to become a man eater or Rakshasa. O Shuktiv Goswami, why did Vasishta, the spiritual master of Sodasa, curse that great soul? I wish to know of this. If it is not a confidential matter, please describe it to me. Once Sodasa went to live in the forest, where he killed a man-eater, or Rakshasa, but forgave and released the man-eater's brother. That brother, however, decided to take revenge. Thinking to harm the king, he became the cook at the king's house. One day, the king's spiritual master, Vasishta Muni, was invited for dinner, and the Rakshasa cook served him human flesh. 
while examining the food given to him, Vasishta Muni, by his mystic power, could understand that it was unfit to eat, being the flesh of a human being. He was very angry at this and immediately cursed Sodasa to become a man-eater. When Vasishta understood that the human flesh had been served by the Rakshasa, not by the king, he undertook twelve years of austerity to cleanse himself for having cursed the faultless king. Meanwhile, King Sodasa took water and chanted the Shapa Mantra, preparing to curse Vasishta, but his wife, Madayanti, forbade him to do so. Then the king saw that the ten directions, the sky, and the surface of the globe were full of living entities everywhere. Saudasa thus acquired the propensity of a man-eater and received on his leg a black spot for which he was known as Kalmashapada. Once King Kalmashapada saw a Brahmin couple engaged in sexual intercourse in the forest. Being influenced by the propensity of a Rakshasa and being very hungry, King Sodasa seized the Brahmin. Then the poor woman, the Brahmin's wife, said to the king, O oh, hero, you are not actually a man-eater. Rather, you are among the descendants of Maharaj Ikshvaku. Indeed, you are a great fighter, the husband of Madayanti. You should not act irreligiously in this way. I desire to have a son. Please, therefore, return my husband, who has not yet impregnated me. O oh, king, O oh, hero, this human body is meant for universal benefits. If you kill this body untimely, you will kill all the benefits of human life. Here is a learned, highly qualified Brahmin engaged in performing austerity and eagerly desiring to worship the Supreme Lord, the Super Soul, who lives within the core of the heart in all living entities. My Lord, you are completely aware of the religious principles. As a son never deserves to be killed by his father, here is a Brahmin who should be protected by the king and never killed. How does he deserve to be killed by a Rajarshi like you? You are well known and worshipped in learned circles. How dare you kill this Brahmin, who is a saintly, sinless person, well versed in Vedic knowledge? Killing him would be like destroying the embryo within the womb, or killing a cow. Without my husband, I cannot live for a moment. If you want to eat my husband, it would be better to eat me first, for without my husband, I am as good as a dead body. Being condemned by the curse of Vasishta, King Sodasa devoured the Brahmin exactly as a tiger eats its prey. Even though the Brahmin's wife spoke so pitiably, Sodasa was unmoved by her lamentation. When the chaste wife of the Brahmin saw that her husband, who was about to discharge semen, had been eaten by the man-eater, she was overwhelmed with grief and lamentation. Thus she angrily cursed the king. O oh, foolish, sinful person! Because you have eaten my husband when I was sexually inclined and desiring to have the seed of a child, I shall also see you die when you attempt to discharge semen in your wife. In other words, whenever you attempt to sexually unite with your wife, you shall die. Thus the wife of the Brahmin cursed King Sodasa, known as Mitrasaha. Then, being inclined to go with her husband, she set fire to her husband's bones, fell into the fire herself, and went with him to the same destination. After twelve years, when King Sodasa was released from the curse by Vasishta, he wanted to have sexual intercourse with his wife. But the queen reminded him about the curse by the Brahmani, and thus he was checked from sexual intercourse. After being thus instructed, the king gave up the future happiness of sexual intercourse, and by destiny remained sunless. Later, with the king's permission, the great saint Vasishta begot a child in the womb of Madayanti. Madayanti bore the child within the womb for seven years and did not give birth. Therefore, Vasishta struck her abdomen with a stone, and then the child was born. Consequently, the child was known as Ashmaka, or the child born of a stone. From Ashmaka, 
Balika took birth. Because Balika was surrounded by women and was therefore saved from the anger of Parushuram, he was known as Narikavacha, or one who is protected by women. When Parashuram vanquished all the Kshatriyas, Balika became the progenitor of more Kshatriyas. Therefore, he was known as Mulaka, the root of the Kshatriya dynasty. From Balika came a son named Dasharath. From Dasharath came a son named Idavidi. And from Idavidi came King Vishvasaha. The son of King Vishvasaha was the famous Maharaj Katvanga. King Katvanga was unconquerable in any fight. Requested by the demigods to join them in fighting the demons, he won victory, and the demigods, being very pleased, wanted to give him a benediction. The king inquired from them about the duration of his life, and was informed that he had only one moment more. Thus he immediately left his palace and went to his own residence, where he engaged his mind fully on the lotus feet of the Lord. Maharaj Katvanga thought, Not even my life is dearer to me than the Brahminical culture and the Brahmins, who are worshipped by my family. What then is to be said of my kingdom, land, wife, children, and opulence? Nothing is dearer to me than the Brahmins. I was never attracted, even in my childhood, by insignificant things or irreligious principles. I did not find anything more substantial than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The demigods, the directors of the three worlds, wanted to give me whatever benediction I desired. I did not want their benedictions, however, because I am interested in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who created everything in this material world. I am more interested in the Supreme Personality of Godhead than in all material benedictions. Even though the demigods have the advantages of being situated in the higher planetary system, their minds, senses, and intelligence are agitated by material conditions. Therefore, even such elevated persons fail to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is eternally situated in the core of the heart. What then is to be said of others, such as human beings, who have fewer advantages? Therefore, I should now give up my attachment for things created by the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I should engage in thought of the Lord, and should thus surrender unto Him. This material creation, having been created by the external energy of the Lord, is like an imaginary town visualized on a hill or in a forest. Every conditioned soul has a natural attraction and attachment for material things, but one must simply give up this attachment and surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus Maharaj Kadvanga, by his advanced intelligence in rendering service to the Lord, gave up false identification with the body full of ignorance. In his original position of eternal servitorship, he engaged himself in rendering service to the Lord. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, Krishna, is extremely difficult to understand for unintelligent men who accept him as impersonal or void, which he is not. The Lord is therefore understood and sung about by pure devotees. Thus ends the ninth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Dynasty of Amshuman. And now chapter 10, The Pastimes of the Supreme Lord, Ramachandra. Shukdev Goswami said, The son of Maharaj Katvanga was Dirgabahu, and his son was the celebrated Maharaj Raghu. From Maharaj Raghu came Aja, and from Aja was born the great personality Maharaj Dasharath. Being prayed for by the demigods, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth Himself, directly appeared with His expansion and expansions of the expansion. Their holy names were Ram, Lakshman, Bharat, and Shatrugna. These celebrated incarnations thus appeared in four forms as the sons of Maharaj Dasharath. 
O King Parikshit, the transcendental activities of Lord Ramchandra have been described by great saintly persons who have seen the truth. Because you have heard again and again about Lord Ramchandra, the husband of Mother Sita, I shall describe these activities only in brief. Please listen. To keep the promise of his father intact, Lord Ramchandra immediately gave up the position of king and, accompanied by his wife, Mother Sita, wandered from one forest to another on his lotus feet, which were so delicate that they were unable to bear even the touch of Sita's palms. The Lord was also accompanied by Hanuman, king of the monkeys, and by his own younger brother, Lord Lakshman, both of whom gave him relief from the fatigue of wandering in the forest. Having cut off the nose and ears of Shurpanaka, thus disfiguring her, the Lord was separated from Mother Sita. He therefore became angry, moving his eyebrows and thus frightening the ocean, who then allowed the Lord to construct a bridge to cross the ocean. Subsequently, the Lord entered the kingdom of Ravan to kill him, like a fire devouring a forest. May that supreme Lord, Ramchandra, give us all protection. In the arena of the sacrifice performed by Vishvamitra, Lord Ramachandra, the king of Ayodhya, killed many demons, rakshasas, and uncivilized men who wandered at night in the mode of darkness. May Lord Ramachandra, who killed these demons in the presence of Lakshman, be kind enough to give us protection. O King, the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra were wonderful, like those of a baby elephant. In the assembly where Mother Sita was to choose her husband in the midst of the heroes of this world, he broke the bow belonging to Lord Shiva. This bow was so heavy that it was carried by three hundred men, but Lord Ramachandra bent and strung it and broke it in the middle, just as a baby elephant breaks a stick of sugar cane. Thus the Lord achieved the hand of Mother Sita, who was equally as endowed with transcendental qualities of form, beauty, behavior, age, and nature. Indeed, she was the goddess of fortune, who constantly rests on the chest of the Lord. While returning from Sita's home, after gaining her at the assembly of competitors, Lord Ramchandra met Parashuram. Although Parashuram was very proud, having rid the earth of the royal order twenty-one times, he was defeated by the Lord, who appeared to be a Kshatriya of the royal order. Carrying out the order of his father, who was bound by a promise to his wife, Lord Ramachandra left behind his kingdom, opulence, friends, well-wishers, residence, and everything else, just as a liberated soul gives up his life and went to the forest with Sita. While wandering in the forest, where he accepted a life of hardship, carrying his invincible bow and arrows in his hand, Lord Ramachandra deformed Ravan's sister, who was polluted with lusty desires by cutting off her nose and ears. He also killed her fourteen thousand Rakshasa friends, headed by Kara, Trishira, and Dushan. O King Parikshit, when Robin, who had ten heads on his shoulders, heard about the beautiful and attractive features of Sita, his mind was agitated by lusty desires, and he went to kidnap her. To distract Lord Ramchandra from his ashram, Robin sent Maricha in the form of a golden deer, and when Lord Ramachandra saw that wonderful deer, he left his residence and followed it, and finally killed it with a sharp arrow, just as Lord Shiva killed Daksha. When Ramachandra entered the forest and Lakshman was also absent, the worst of the Rakshasas, Ravan, kidnapped Sita Devi, the daughter of the king of Videya, just as a tiger seizes unprotected sheep when the shepherd is absent. Then Lord Ramachandra wandered in the forest with his brother Lakshman, as if very much distressed due to separation from his wife. Thus he showed by his personal example the condition of a person attached to women. Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet are worshipped by Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, had assumed the form of a human being. Thus he performed the funeral ceremony of Jatayu, who was killed by Ravan. The Lord then killed the demon named Kabanda, 
and after making friends with the monkey chiefs, killing Bali and arranging for the deliverance of Mother Sita, he went to the beach of the ocean. After reaching the beach, Lord Ramchandra fasted for three days, awaiting the arrival of the ocean personified. When the ocean did not come, the Lord exhibited his pastimes of anger, and simply by his glancing over the ocean, all the living entities within it, including the crocodiles and sharks, were agitated by fear. Then the personified ocean fearfully approached Lord Ramachandra, taking all paraphernalia to worship him. Falling at the Lord's lotus feet, the personified ocean spoke as follows. O oh, all-pervading Supreme Person, we are dull-minded and did not understand who you are, but now we understand that you are the Supreme Person, the Master of the entire universe, the unchanging and original Personality of Godhead. The demigods are infatuated with the mode of goodness, the prajapatis with the mode of passion, and the lord of ghosts with the mode of ignorance. But you are the master of all these qualities. My lord, you may use my water as you like. Indeed, you may cross it and go to the abode of Robin, who is the great source of disturbance and crying for the three worlds. He is the son of Vishrabha, but is condemned like urine. Please go kill him and thus regain your wife Sita Devi. O oh, great hero, although my water presents no impediment to your going to Lanka, please construct a bridge over it to spread your transcendental fame. Upon seeing this wonderfully uncommon deed of your lordship, all the great heroes and kings in the future will glorify you. After constructing a bridge over the ocean by throwing into the water the peaks of mountains whose trees and other vegetation had been shaken by the hands of great monkeys, Lord Ramachandra went to Lanka to release Sita Devi from the clutches of Ravan. With the direction and help of the Bishan, Robin's brother, the Lord, along with the monkey soldiers headed by Sugriv, Nila, and Hanuman, entered Robin's kingdom, Lanka, which had previously been burnt by Hanuman. After entering Lanka, the monkey soldiers, led by chiefs like Sugriv, Nila, and Hanuman, occupied all the sporting houses, granaries, treasuries, palace doorways, city gates, assembly houses, palace frontages, and even the resting houses of the pigeons. When the city's crossroads, platforms, flags, and golden water pots on its domes were all destroyed, the entire city of Lanka appeared like a river disturbed by a herd of elephants. When Robin, the master of the Rakshasas, saw the disturbances created by the monkey soldiers, he called for Nikumba, Kumba, Dumraksha, Durmuka, Surantaka, Narantaka, and other Rakshasas, and also his son Indrajit. Thereafter he called for Prahasta, Atikaya, the Kampana, and finally Kumbakarna. Then he induced all his followers to fight against the enemies. Lord Ramachandra, surrounded by Lakshman and monkey soldiers like Sugriv, Hanuman, Gandamada, Nila, Angada, Jambavan, and Panasa, attacked the soldiers of the Rakshasas, who were fully equipped with various invincible weapons like swords, lances, bows, prasas, rishtis, Shakti arrows, kudgas, and tomaras. Angada and the other commanders of the soldiers of Ramchandra faced the elephants, infantry, horses, and chariots of the enemy and hurled against them big trees, mountain peaks, clubs, and arrows. Thus the soldiers of Lord Ramchandra killed Robin's soldiers who had lost all good fortune because Robin had been condemned by the anger of Mother Sita. Thereafter, when Robin, the king of the Rakshasas, observed that his soldiers had been lost, he was extremely angry. Thus he mounted his airplane, which was decorated with flowers, and proceeded toward Lord Ramchandra, who sat on the effulgent chariot brought by Matali, the chariot driver of Indra. 
Then Ravan struck Lord Ramachandra with sharp arrows. Lord Ramachandra said to Ravan, You are the most abominable of the man-eaters. Indeed, you are like their stool. You resemble a dog, for as a dog steals edibles from the kitchen in the absence of the householder, in my absence you kidnap my wife Sita Devi. Therefore, as Yamaraj punishes sinful men, I shall also punish you. You are most abominable, sinful, and shameless. Today, therefore, I, whose attempt never fails, shall punish you. After thus rebuking Robin, Lord Ramchandra fixed an arrow to his bow, aimed at Robin, and released the arrow, which pierced Robin's heart like a thunderbolt. Upon seeing this, Robin's followers raised a tumultuous sound, crying, Alas! Alas! What has happened? What has happened? As Robin, vomiting blood from his ten mouths, fell from his airplane, just as a pious man falls to the earth from the heavenly planets when the results of his pious activities are exhausted. Thereafter, all the women whose husbands had fallen in the battle, headed by Mando Dari, the wife of Robin, came out of Lanka. Continuously crying, they approached the dead bodies of Robin and the other Rakshasas. Striking their breasts in affliction because their husbands had been killed by the arrows of Lakshman, the women embraced their respective husbands and cried piteously in voices appealing to everyone. O oh my Lord, O oh Master, you epitomize trouble for others, and therefore you are called Robin. But now that you have been defeated, we also are defeated. For without you, the state of Lanka has been conquered by the enemy. To whom will it go for shelter? O oh, greatly fortunate one, you came under the influence of lusty desires, and therefore you could not understand the influence of Mother Sita. Now, because of her curse, you have been reduced to this state, having been killed by Lord Ramachandra. See, because of you, the state of Lanka, and also we ourselves, now have no protector. By your deeds you have made your body fit to be eaten by vultures, and your soul fit to go to hell. The Bishan, the pious brother of Ravan and devotee of Lord Ramachandra, received approval from Lord Ramachandra, the king of Koshala. Then he performed the prescribed funeral ceremonies for his family members to save them from the path to hell. Thereafter, Lord Ramachandra found Sita Devi sitting in a small cottage beneath the tree named Shimshapa in a forest of Ashok trees. She was lean and thin, being aggrieved because of separation from him. Seeing his wife in that condition, Lord Ramchandra was very compassionate. When Ramchandra came before her, she was exceedingly happy to see her beloved, and her lotus-like mouth showed her joy. After giving the Bishan the power to rule the Rakshasa population of Lanka for the duration of one kalpa, Lord Ramchandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, placed Sita Devi on an airplane decorated with flowers, and then he got on the plane himself. The period for his living in the forest having ended, the Lord returned to Ayodhya, accompanied by Hanuman, Sugriv, and his brother Lakshman. When Lord Ramchandra returned to his capital, Ayodhya, he was greeted on the road by the princely order who showered his body with beautiful, fragrant flowers while great personalities like Lord Brahma and other demigods glorified the activities of the Lord in great jubilation. Upon reaching Ayodhya, Lord Ramachandra heard that in his absence his brother Bharat was eating barley cooked in the urine of a cow, covering his body with the bark of trees, wearing matted locks of hair, and lying on a mattress of kusha. The most merciful Lord very much lamented this. When Lord Bharat understood that Lord Ramachandra was returning to the capital, Ayodhya, he immediately took upon his own head Lord Ramachandra's wooden shoes and came out from his camp at Nandigram. Lord Bharat was accompanied by ministers, priests, and other respectable citizens, by professional musicians vibrating pleasing musical sounds, and by learned Brahmins loudly chanting Vedic hymns. Following in the procession were chariots drawn by beautiful horses with harnesses of golden rope. 
These chariots were decorated by flags with golden embroidery and by other flags of various sizes and patterns. There were soldiers bedecked with golden armor, servants bearing betel nut, and many well-known and beautiful prostitutes. Many servants followed on foot, bearing an umbrella, whisks, different grades of precious jewels, and other paraphernalia befitting a royal reception. Accompanied in this way, Lord Bodet, his heart softened in ecstasy and his eyes full of tears, approached Lord Ramachandra and fell at his lotus feet with great ecstatic love. After offering the wooden shoes before Lord Ramachandra, Lord Bharat stood with folded hands, his eyes full of tears, and Lord Ramachandra bathed Bharat with tears while embracing him with both arms for a long time. Accompanied by Mother Sita and Lakshman, Lord Ramachandra then offered his respectful obeisances unto the learned Brahmins and the elderly persons in the family, and all the citizens of Ayodhya offered their respectful obeisances unto the Lord. The citizens of Ayodhya, upon seeing their king return after a long absence, offered him flower garlands, waved their upper cloths, and danced in great jubilation. O King, Lord Bharat carried Lord Ramachandra's wooden shoes. Sugriv and Vibhishan carried a whisk and an excellent fan. Hanuman carried a white umbrella. Shatrugna carried a bow and two quivers. And Sita Devi carried a water pot filled with water from holy places. Angada carried a sword. And Jambavan, king of the rikshas, carried a golden shield. O King Parikshit, as the Lord sat on his airplane of flowers, with offering him prayers and reciters chanting about his characteristics, he appeared like the moon with the stars and planets. Thereafter, having been welcomed by his brother Bharat, Lord Ramachandra entered the city of Ayodhya in the midst of a festival. When he entered the palace, he offered obeisances to all the mothers, including Kaikei and the other wives of Maharaj Dasharath and especially his own mother, Kaushalya. He also offered obeisances to the spiritual preceptors, such as Vasishta. Friends of his own age and younger friends worshipped him, and he returned their respectful obeisances, as did Lakshman and Mother Sita. In this way they all entered the palace. Upon seeing their sons, the mothers of Ram and Lakshman, Bharat and Shatrugan, immediately arose, like unconscious bodies returning to consciousness. The mothers placed their sons on their laps and bathed them with tears, thus relieving themselves of the grief of long separation. The family priest or spiritual master, Vasishta, had Lord Ramchandra cleanly shaved, freeing him from his matted locks of hair. Then, with the cooperation of the elderly members of the family, he performed the bathing ceremony, or Abhishek, for Lord Ramachandra with the water of the four seas and with other substances, just as it was performed for King Indra. Lord Ramachandra fully bathed and his head clean-shaven, dressed himself very nicely, and was decorated with a garland and ornaments. Thus he shone brightly, surrounded by his brothers and wife, who were similarly dressed and ornamented. Being pleased by the full surrender and submission of Lord Bharat, Lord Ramachandra then accepted the throne of the state. He cared for the citizens exactly like a father, and the citizens, being fully engaged in their occupational duties of Varna and Ashram, accepted him as their father. Lord Ramchandra became king during Treta Yuga, but because of his good government, the age was like Satya Yuga. Everyone was religious and completely happy. O Maharaj Pariksit, best of the Bharat dynasty, during the reign of Lord Ramchandra, the forests, the rivers, the hills and mountains, the states, the seven islands and the seven seas were all favorable in supplying the necessities of life for all living beings. When Lord Ramchandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was the king of this world, all bodily and mental suffering, disease, old age, bereavement, lamentation, distress, fear and fatigue were completely absent. There was even no death 
for those who did not want it. Lord Ramchandra took a vow to accept only one wife and have no connection with any other women. He was a saintly king, and everything in his character was good, untinged by qualities like anger. He taught good behavior for everyone, especially for householders, in terms of Varnashram Dharma. Thus he taught the general public by his personal activities. Mother Sita was very submissive, faithful, shy, and chaste, always understanding the attitude of her husband. Thus, by her character and her love and service, she completely attracted the mind of the Lord. Thus ends the tenth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Pastimes of the Supreme Lord Ramchandra. And now chapter eleven, Lord Ramchandra rules the world. Shukdev Goswami said, Thereafter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramchandra, accepted an acharya and performed sacrifices with opulent paraphernalia. Thus he himself worshipped himself, for he is the Supreme Lord of all demigods. Lord Ramchandra gave the entire East to the Hota priest, the entire South to the Brahma priest, the West to the Advaryu priest, and the North to the Udgata priest, the reciter of the Samveda. In this way he donated his kingdom. Thereafter, thinking that because the Brahmins have no material desires, they should possess the entire world, Lord Ramchandra delivered the land between the east, west, north and south to the Acharya. After thus giving everything in charity to the Brahmins, Lord Ramchandra retained only his personal garments and ornaments, and similarly the queen, Mother Sita, was left with only her nose ring and nothing else. All the Brahmins who were engaged in the various activities of the sacrifice were very pleased with Lord Ramchandra, who was greatly affectionate and favorable to the Brahmins. Thus, with melted hearts, they returned all the property received from him and spoke as follows. O Lord, you are the master of the entire universe. What have you not given us? You have entered the core of our hearts and dissipated the darkness of our ignorance by your effulgence. This is the supreme gift. We do not need a material donation. O Lord, you are the supreme personality of Godhead who have accepted the Brahmins as your worshipable deity. Your knowledge and memory are never disturbed by anxiety. You are the chief of all famous persons within this world and your lotus feet are worshipped by sages who are beyond the jurisdiction of punishment. O Lord Ramchandra, let us offer our respectful obeisances unto you. Once while Lord Ramchandra was walking at night incognito, hiding himself by a disguise to find out the people's opinion of himself, he heard a man speaking unfavorably about his wife, Sita Devi. Speaking to his unchaste wife, the man said, you go to another man's house, and therefore you are unchaste and polluted. I shall not maintain you any more. A henpecked husband like Lord Ram may accept a wife like Sita, who went to another man's house, but I am not henpecked like him, and therefore I shall not accept you again. Men with a poor fund of knowledge and a heinous character speak nonsensically. Fearing such rascals, Lord Ramchandra abandoned his wife, Sita Devi, although she was pregnant. Thus Sita Devi went to the ashram of Valmiki Muni. When the time came, the pregnant mother Sita Devi gave birth to twin sons, later celebrated as Lava and Kusha. The ritualistic ceremonies for their birth were performed by Valmiki Muni. O Maharaj Pariksit, Lord Lakshman had two sons named Angada and Chitraketu, and Lord Bharat also had two sons named Taksha and Pushkala. Shatrugna had two sons named Subahu and Shrutasena. When Lord Bharat went to conquer all directions, he had to kill many millions of Gandharvas who are generally pretenders. Taking all their wealth, he offered it to Lord Ramchandra. Shatrugna also killed a Rakshasa named Lavana, who was the son of Madhu Rakshasa. 
Thus he established in the great forest known as Maduvan, the town known as Mathura. Being forsaken by her husband, Sita Devi entrusted her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni. Thus meditating upon the lotus feet of Lord Ramchandra, she entered into the earth. After hearing the news of Mother Sita's entering the earth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead was certainly aggrieved. Although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, upon remembering the exalted qualities of Mother Sita, he could not check his grief in transcendental love. The attraction between man and woman, or male and female, always exists everywhere, making everyone always fearful. Such feelings are present even among the controllers like Brahma and Lord Shiva, and is the cause of fear for them, what to speak of others who are attached to household life in this material world. After Mother Sita entered the earth, Lord Ramchandra observed complete celibacy and performed an uninterrupted Agnihotra Yajna for 13,000 years. After completing the sacrifice, Lord Ramchandra, whose lotus feet were sometimes pierced by thorns when he lived in Dandakaranya, placed those lotus feet in the hearts of those who always think of him. Then he entered his own abode, the Vaikuntha planet, beyond the Brahmagyoti. Lord Ramchandra's reputation for having killed Ravan with showers of arrows at the request of the demigods, and for having built a bridge over the ocean, does not constitute the factual glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramchandra, whose spiritual body is always engaged in various pastimes. Lord Ramchandra has no equal or superior, and therefore he had no need to take help from the monkeys to gain victory over Ravan. Lord Ramachandra's spotless name and fame, which vanquish all sinful reactions, are celebrated in all directions, like the ornamental cloth of the victorious elephant that conquers all directions. Great saintly persons like Mark and Dea Rishi still glorify his characteristics in the assemblies of great emperors like Maharaj Yudhishthir. Similarly, all the saintly kings and all the demigods, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, worship the Lord by bowing down with their helmets. Let me offer my obeisances unto his lotus feet. Lord Ramachandra returned to his abode, to which bhakti yogis are promoted. This is the place to which all the inhabitants of Ayodhya went after they served the Lord in his manifest pastimes by offering him obeisances, touching his lotus feet, fully observing him as a father-like king, sitting or lying down with him like equals, or even just accompanying him. O King Pariksit, Anyone who orally receives the narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes will ultimately be freed from the disease of envy and thus be liberated from the bondage of fruitive activities. How did the Lord conduct himself and how did he behave in relationship with his brothers who were expansions of his own self? And how did his brothers and the inhabitants of Ayodhya treat him? After accepting the throne of the government by the fervent request of his younger brother Bharat, Lord Ramachandra ordered his younger brothers to go out and conquer the entire world, while he personally remained in the capital to give audience to all the citizens and residents of the palace and supervise the governmental affairs with his other assistants. During the reign of Lord Ramchandra, the streets of the capital, Ayodhya, were sprinkled with perfumed water and drops of perfumed liquor, thrown about by elephants from their trunks. When the citizens saw the Lord personally supervising the affairs of the city in such opulence, they appreciated this opulence very much. The palaces, the palace gates, the assembly houses, the platforms for meeting places, the temples and all such places were decorated with golden water pots and bedecked with various types of flags. Wherever Lord Ramchandra visited, auspicious welcome gates were constructed with banana trees and betel nut trees full of flowers and fruits. The gates were decorated with various flags made of colorful cloth and with tapestries, mirrors and garlands. 
Wherever Lord Ramchandra visited, the people approached him with paraphernalia of worship and begged the Lord's blessings. O Lord, they said, as you rescued the earth from the bottom of the sea in your incarnation as a boar, may you now maintain it. Thus we beg your blessings. Thereafter, not having seen the Lord for a long time, the citizens, both men and women, being very eager to see him, left their homes and got up on the roofs of the palaces. Being incompletely satiated with seeing the face of the lotus-eyed Lord Ramchandra, they showered flowers upon him. Thereafter, Lord Ramchandra entered the palace of his forefathers. Within the palace were various treasures and valuable wardrobes. The sitting places on the two sides of the entrance door were made of coral. The yards were surrounded by pillars of Vaidurya money. The floor was made of highly polished Marakata money, and the foundation was made of marble. The entire palace was decorated with flags and garlands and bedecked with valuable stones shining with a celestial effulgence. The palace was fully decorated with pearls and surrounded by lamps and incense. The men and women within the palace all resembled demigods and were decorated with various ornaments which seemed beautiful because of being placed on their bodies. Lord Ramachandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, chief of the best learned scholars, resided in that place with his pleasure potency, Mother Sita, and enjoyed complete peace. Without transgressing the religious principles, Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet are worshipped by devotees in meditation, enjoyed with all the paraphernalia of transcendental pleasure for as long as needed. Thus ends the eleventh chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Lord Ramachandra Rules the World.
Ganges to bring the Ganges to this material world. Thereafter, Mother Ganges appeared before King Bhagiratha and said, I am very much satisfied with your austerities and am now prepared to give you benedictions as you desire. Being thus addressed by Ganga Devi, Mother Ganges, the king bowed his head before her and explained his desire. Mother Ganges replied, When I fall from the sky to the surface of the planet Earth, the water will certainly be very forceful. Who will sustain that force? If I am not sustained, I shall pierce the surface of the Earth and go down to Rasatala, the Patala area of the universe. O king, I do not wish to go down to the planet Earth, for there the people in general will bathe in my water to cleanse themselves of the reactions of their sinful deeds. When all these sinful reactions accumulate in me, how shall I become free from them? You must consider this very carefully. Bhagiratha said, Those who are saintly because of devotional service and are therefore in the renounced order, free from material desires, and who are pure devotees, expert in following the regulative principles mentioned in the Vedas, are always glorious and pure in behavior and are able to deliver all fallen souls. When such pure devotees bathe in your water, the sinful reactions accumulated from other people will certainly be counteracted. For such devotees always keep in the core of their hearts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who can vanquish all sinful reactions. Like a cloth woven of threads extending for its length and breadth, this entire universe, in all its latitude and longitude, is situated under different potencies of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Shiva is the incarnation of the Lord, and thus he represents the Supersoul in the embodied soul. He can sustain your forceful waves on his head. After saying this, Bhagirata satisfied Lord Shiva by performing austerities. O King Pariksit, Lord Shiva was very quickly satisfied with Bhagirata. When King Bhagirata approached Lord Shiva, and requested him to sustain the forceful waves of the Ganges, Lord Shiva accepted the proposal by saying, Let it be so. Then with great attention he sustained the Ganges on his head, for the water of the Ganges is purifying, having emanated from the toes of Lord Vishnu. The great and saintly king Bhagirata brought the Ganges, which can deliver all the fallen souls, to that place on earth where the bodies of his forefathers lay burnt to ashes. Bhagirata mounted a swift chariot and drove before Mother Ganges, who followed him, purifying many countries until they reached the ashes of Bhagirata's forefathers, the sons of Sagara, who were thus sprinkled with water from the Ganges. Because the sons of Sagara Maharaj had offended a great personality, the heat of their bodies had increased and they were burnt to ashes. But simply by being sprinkled with water from the Ganges, all of them became eligible to go to the heavenly planets. What then is to be said of those who use the water of Mother Ganges to worship her? Simply by having water from the Ganges come in contact with the ashes of their burnt bodies, the sons of Sagara Maharaj were elevated to the heavenly planets. Therefore, what is to be said of a devotee who worships Mother Ganges faithfully with a determined vow? One can only imagine the benefit that accrues to such a devotee. Because Mother Ganges emanates from the lotus toe of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Anantadev, she is able to liberate one from material bondage. Therefore, whatever is described herewith about her is not at all wonderful. Great sages, completely freed from material lusty desires, devote their minds fully to the service of the Lord. Such persons are liberated from material bondage without difficulty, and they become transcendentally situated, acquiring the spiritual quality of the Lord. This is the glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Bhagirata had a son named Shruta, whose son was Naba. This son was different from the Naba previously described. Naba had a son named Sindhudvipa. From Sindhudvipa came Ayutayu, and from Ayutayu came Rituparna, 
who became a friend of Nalaraj. Rituparna taught Nalaraj the art of gambling, and Nalaraj gave Rituparna lessons in controlling and maintaining horses. The son of Rituparna was Sarvakama. Sarvakama had a son named Sudasa, whose son, known as Sodasa, was the husband of Damayanti. Sodasa is sometimes known as Mitra Saha or Kalmashapada. Because of his own misdeed, Mitra Saha was sonless and was cursed by Vasishta to become a man eater or Rakshasa. O Shuktiv Goswami, why did Vasishta, the spiritual master of Sodasa, curse that great soul? I wish to know of this. If it is not a confidential matter, please describe it to me. Once Sodasa went to live in the forest, where he killed a man-eater, or Rakshasa, but forgave and released the man-eater's brother. That brother, however, decided to take revenge. Thinking to harm the king, he became the cook at the king's house. One day, the king's spiritual master, Vasishta Muni, was invited for dinner, and the Rakshasa cook served him human flesh. While examining the food given to him, Vasishta Muni, by his mystic power, could understand that it was unfit to eat, being the flesh of a human being. He was very angry at this and immediately cursed Sodasa to become a man-eater. When Vasishta understood that the human flesh had been served by the Rakshasa, not by the king, he undertook twelve years of austerity to cleanse himself for having cursed the faultless king. Meanwhile, King Sodasa took water and chanted the Shapa Mantra, preparing to curse Vasishta, but his wife, Madayanti, forbade him to do so. Then the king saw that the ten directions, the sky, and the surface of the globe were full of living entities everywhere. Saudasa thus acquired the propensity of a man-eater and received on his leg a black spot for which he was known as Kalmashapada. Once King Kalmashapada saw a Brahmin couple engaged in sexual intercourse in the forest. Being influenced by the propensity of a Rakshasa, and being very hungry, King Sodasa seized the Brahmin. Then the poor woman, the Brahmin's wife, said to the king, O oh, hero, you are not actually a man-eater. Rather, you are among the descendants of Maharaj Ikshvaku. Indeed, you are a great fighter, the husband of Madayanti. You should not act irreligiously in this way. I desire to have a son. Please, therefore, return my husband, who has not yet impregnated me. O oh, king, O oh, hero, this human body is meant for universal benefits. If you kill this body untimely, you will kill all the benefits of human life. Here is a learned, highly qualified Brahmin engaged in performing austerity and eagerly desiring to worship the Supreme Lord, the Super Soul, who lives within the core of the heart in all living entities. My Lord, you are completely aware of the religious principles. As a son never deserves to be killed by his father, here is a Brahmin who should be protected by the king and never killed. How does he deserve to be killed by a Rajarshi like you? You are well known and worshipped in learned circles. How dare you kill this Brahmin, who is a saintly, sinless person, well versed in Vedic knowledge. Killing him would be like destroying the embryo within the womb, or killing a cow. Without my husband, I cannot live for a moment. If you want to eat my husband, it would be better to eat me first, for without my husband, I am as good as a dead body. Being condemned by the curse of Vasishta, King Sodasa devoured the Brahmin exactly as a tiger eats its prey. Even though the Brahmin's wife spoke so pitiably, Sodasa was unmoved by her lamentation. When the chaste wife of the Brahmin saw that her husband, who was about to discharge semen, had been eaten by the man-eater, she was overwhelmed with grief and lamentation. Thus she angrily cursed the king. O oh, foolish, sinful person! Because you have eaten my husband when I was sexually inclined and desiring to have the seed of a child, 
I shall also see you die when you attempt to discharge semen in your wife. In other words, whenever you attempt to sexually unite with your wife, you shall die. Thus the wife of the Brahmin cursed King Sodasa, known as Mitrasaha. Then, being inclined to go with her husband, she set fire to her husband's bones, fell into the fire herself, and went with him to the same destination. After twelve years, when King Sodasa was released from the curse by Vasishta, he wanted to have sexual intercourse with his wife. But the queen reminded him about the curse by the Brahmani, and thus he was checked from sexual intercourse. After being thus instructed, the king gave up the future happiness of sexual intercourse, and by destiny remained sunless. Later, with the king's permission, the great saint Vasishta begot a child in the womb of Madayanti. Madayanti bore the child within the womb for seven years and did not give birth. Therefore, Vasishta struck her abdomen with a stone, and then the child was born. Consequently, the child was known as Ashmaka, or the child born of a stone. From Ashmaka, Balika took birth. Because Balika was surrounded by women and was therefore saved from the anger of Parushuram, he was known as Nadi Kavacha, or one who is protected by women. When Parashuram vanquished all the Kshatriyas, Balika became the progenitor of more Kshatriyas. Therefore, he was known as Mulaka, the root of the Kshatriya dynasty. From Balika came a son named Dasharath. From Dasharath came a son named Idavidi. And from Idavidi came King Vishvasaha. The son of King Vishvasaha was the famous Maharaj Katvanga. King Katvanga was unconquerable in any fight. Requested by the demigods to join them in fighting the demons, he won victory, and the demigods, being very pleased, wanted to give him a benediction. The king inquired from them about the duration of his life, and was informed that he had only one moment more. Thus he immediately left his palace and went to his own residence, where he engaged his mind fully on the lotus feet of the Lord. Maharaj Katvanga thought, Not even my life is dearer to me than the Brahminical culture and the Brahmins, who are worshipped by my family. What then is to be said of my kingdom, land, wife, children, and opulence? Nothing is dearer to me than the Brahmins. I was never attracted, even in my childhood, by insignificant things or irreligious principles. I did not find anything more substantial than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The demigods, the directors of the three worlds, wanted to give me whatever benediction I desired. I did not want their benedictions, however, because I am interested in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who created everything in this material world. I am more interested in the Supreme Personality of Godhead than in all material benedictions. Even though the demigods have the advantages of being situated in the higher planetary system, their minds, senses, and intelligence are agitated by material conditions. Therefore, even such elevated persons fail to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is eternally situated in the core of the heart. What then is to be said of others, such as human beings, who have fewer advantages? Therefore, I should now give up my attachment for things created by the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I should engage in thought of the Lord, and should thus surrender unto Him. This material creation, having been created by the external energy of the Lord, is like an imaginary town visualized on a hill or in a forest. Every conditioned soul has a natural attraction and attachment for material things, but one must simply give up this attachment and surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus Maharaj Kadvanga, by his advanced intelligence in rendering service to the Lord, gave up false identification with the body full of ignorance. 
In his original position of eternal servitorship, he engaged himself in rendering service to the Lord. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, Krishna, is extremely difficult to understand for unintelligent men who accept him as impersonal or void, which he is not. The Lord is therefore understood and sung about by pure devotees. Thus ends the ninth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Dynasty of Amshuman. And now chapter 10, The Pastimes of the Supreme Lord, Ramachandra. Shukdev Goswami said, the son of Maharaj Katvanga was Dirgabahu, and his son was the celebrated Maharaj Raghu. From Maharaj Raghu came Aja, and from Aja was born the great personality Maharaj Dasharat. Being prayed for by the demigods, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth Himself, directly appeared with His expansion and expansions of the expansion. Their holy names were Ram, Lakshman, Bharat, and Shatrugna. These celebrated incarnations thus appeared in four forms as the sons of Maharaj Dasharat. O King Parikshit, the transcendental activities of Lord Ramchandra have been described by great saintly persons who have seen the truth. Because you have heard again and again about Lord Ramchandra, the husband of Mother Sita, I shall describe these activities only in brief. Please listen. To keep the promise of his father intact, Lord Ramachandra immediately gave up the position of king and, accompanied by his wife, Mother Sita, wandered from one forest to another on his lotus feet, which were so delicate that they were unable to bear even the touch of Sita's palms. The Lord was also accompanied by Hanuman, king of the monkeys, and by his own younger brother, Lord Lakshman, both of whom gave him relief from the fatigue of wandering in the forest. Having cut off the nose and ears of Shurpanaka, thus disfiguring her, the Lord was separated from Mother Sita. He therefore became angry, moving his eyebrows and thus frightening the ocean, who then allowed the Lord to construct a bridge to cross the ocean. Subsequently, the Lord entered the kingdom of Ravan to kill him, like a fire devouring a forest. May that supreme Lord, Ramchandra, give us all protection. In the arena of the sacrifice performed by Vishvamitra, Lord Ramachandra, the king of Ayodhya, killed many demons, rakshasas, and uncivilized men who wandered at night in the mode of darkness. May Lord Ramachandra, who killed these demons in the presence of Lakshman, be kind enough to give us protection. O King, the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra were wonderful, like those of a baby elephant. In the assembly where Mother Sita was to choose her husband, in the midst of the heroes of this world, he broke the bow belonging to Lord Shiva. This bow was so heavy that it was carried by three hundred men. But Lord Ramachandra bent and strung it and broke it in the middle, just as a baby elephant breaks a stick of sugar cane. Thus the Lord achieved the hand of Mother Sita, who was equally as endowed with transcendental qualities of form, beauty, behavior, age, and nature. Indeed, she was the goddess of fortune, who constantly rests on the chest of the Lord. While returning from Sita's home, after gaining her at the assembly of competitors, Lord Ramchandra met Parashuram. Although Parashuram was very proud, having rid the earth of the royal order twenty-one times, he was defeated by the Lord, who appeared to be a Kshatriya of the royal order. Carrying out the order of his father, who was bound by a promise to his wife, Lord Ramachandra left behind his kingdom, opulence, friends, well-wishers, residence, and everything else, just as a liberated soul gives up his life and went to the forest with Sita. While wandering in the forest, where he accepted a life of hardship, carrying his invincible bow and arrows in his hand, Lord Ramachandra deformed Ravan's sister, who was polluted with lusty desires by cutting off her nose and ears. 
He also killed her 14,000 Rakshasa friends headed by Kara, Trishira and Dushan. O King Parikshit, when Robin, who had ten heads on his shoulders, heard about the beautiful and attractive features of Sita, his mind was agitated by lusty desires, and he went to kidnap her. To distract Lord Ramchandra from his ashram, Robin sent Maricha in the form of a golden deer, and when Lord Ramchandra saw that wonderful deer, he left his residence and followed it, and finally killed it with a sharp arrow, just as Lord Shiva killed Daksha. When Ramchandra entered the forest and Lakshman was also absent, the worst of the Rakshasas, Robin, kidnapped Sita Devi, the daughter of the king of Videya, just as a tiger seizes unprotected sheep when the shepherd is absent. Then Lord Ramachandra wandered in the forest with his brother Lakshman, as if very much distressed due to separation from his wife. Thus he showed by his personal example the condition of a person attached to women. Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet are worshipped by Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, had assumed the form of a human being. Thus he performed the funeral ceremony of Jatayu, who was killed by Robin. The Lord then killed the demon named Kabanda, and after making friends with the monkey chiefs, killing Bali and arranging for the deliverance of Mother Sita, he went to the beach of the ocean. After reaching the beach, Lord Ramchandra fasted for three days, awaiting the arrival of the ocean personified. When the ocean did not come, the Lord exhibited his pastimes of anger, and simply by his glancing over the ocean, all the living entities within it, including the crocodiles and sharks, were agitated by fear. Then the personified ocean fearfully approached Lord Ramachandra, taking all paraphernalia to worship him. Falling at the Lord's lotus feet, the personified ocean spoke as follows. O all-pervading Supreme Person, we are dull-minded and did not understand who you are, but now we understand that you are the Supreme Person, the Master of the entire universe, the unchanging and original Personality of Godhead. The demigods are infatuated with the mode of goodness, the prajapatis with the mode of passion, and the lord of ghosts with the mode of ignorance. But you are the master of all these qualities. My lord, you may use my water as you like. Indeed, you may cross it and go to the abode of Robin, who is the great source of disturbance and crying for the three worlds. He is the son of Vishrabha, but is condemned like urine. Please go kill him and thus regain your wife Sita Devi. O great hero, although my water presents no impediment to your going to Lanka, please construct a bridge over it to spread your transcendental fame. Upon seeing this wonderfully uncommon deed of your lordship, all the great heroes and kings in the future will glorify you. After constructing a bridge over the ocean by throwing into the water the peaks of mountains whose trees and other vegetation had been shaken by the hands of great monkeys, Lord Ramachandra went to Lanka to release Sita Devi from the clutches of Ravan. With the direction and help of the Bishan, Robin's brother, the Lord, along with the monkey soldiers headed by Sugriv, Nila, and Hanuman, entered Robin's kingdom, Lanka, which had previously been burnt by Hanuman. After entering Lanka, the monkey soldiers, led by chiefs like Sugriv, Nila, and Hanuman, occupied all the sporting houses, granaries, treasuries, palace doorways, city gates, assembly houses, palace frontages, and even the resting houses of the pigeons. When the city's crossroads, platforms, flags, and golden water pots on its domes were all destroyed, the entire city of Lanka appeared like a river disturbed by a herd of elephants. When Robin, the master of the Rakshasas, saw the disturbances created by the monkey soldiers, he called for Nikumba, Kumba, Dumraksha, Durmuka, Surantaka, Narantaka, and other Rakshasas, 
and also his son Indrajit. Thereafter he called for Prahasta, Atikaya, the Kampana, and finally Kumbhakarna. Then he induced all his followers to fight against the enemies. Lord Ramachandra, surrounded by Lakshman and monkey soldiers like Sugriv, Hanuman, Gandamada, Nila, Angada, Jambavan, and Panasa, attacked the soldiers of the Rakshasas, who were fully equipped with various invincible weapons like swords, lances, bows, prasas, rishtis, shakti arrows, kudgas, and tomaras. Angada and the other commanders of the soldiers of Ramchandra faced the elephants, infantry, horses, and chariots of the enemy, and hurled against them big trees, mountain peaks, clubs, and arrows. Thus the soldiers of Lord Ramchandra killed Ravan's soldiers, who had lost all good fortune, because Ravan had been condemned by the anger of Mother Sita. Thereafter, when Ravan, the king of the Rakshasas, observed that his soldiers had been lost, he was extremely angry. Thus he mounted his airplane, which was decorated with flowers, and proceeded toward Lord Ramchandra, who sat on the effulgent chariot brought by Matali, the chariot driver of Indra. Then Ravan struck Lord Ramchandra with sharp arrows. Lord Ramachandra said to Ravan, You are the most abominable of the man-eaters. Indeed, you are like their stool. You resemble a dog, for as a dog steals edibles from the kitchen in the absence of the householder, in my absence you kidnap my wife Sita Devi. Therefore, as Yamaraj punishes sinful men, I shall also punish you. You are most abominable, sinful, and shameless. Today, therefore, I, whose attempt never fails, shall punish you. After thus rebuking Ravan, Lord Ramchandra fixed an arrow to his bow, aimed at Ravan, and released the arrow, which pierced Ravan's heart like a thunderbolt. Upon seeing this, Ravan's followers raised a tumultuous sound, crying, Alas! Alas! What has happened? What has happened? As Ravan, vomiting blood from his ten mouths, fell from his airplane, just as a pious man falls to the earth from the heavenly planets when the results of his pious activities are exhausted. Thereafter, all the women whose husbands had fallen in the battle, headed by Mando Dari, the wife of Robin, came out of Lanka. Continuously crying, they approached the dead bodies of Robin and the other Rakshasas striking their breasts in affliction because their husbands had been killed by the arrows of Lakshman, the women embraced their respective husbands and cried piteously in voices appealing to everyone. O oh my Lord, O oh Master, you epitomized trouble for others, and therefore you were called Robin. But now that you have been defeated, we also are defeated, for without you the state of Lanka has been conquered by the enemy. To whom will it go for shelter? O oh, greatly fortunate one, you came under the influence of lusty desires, and therefore you could not understand the influence of Mother Sita. Now, because of her curse, you have been reduced to this state, having been killed by Lord Ramachandra. Because of you, the state of Lanka, and also we ourselves, now have no protector. By your deeds you have made your body fit to be eaten by vultures, and your soul fit to go to hell. The Bishan, the pious brother of Ravan and devotee of Lord Ramachandra, received approval from Lord Ramachandra, the king of Koshala. Then he performed the prescribed funeral ceremonies for his family members to save them from the path to hell. Thereafter, Lord Ramachandra found Sita Devi sitting in a small cottage beneath the tree named Shimshapa in a forest of Ashok trees. She was lean and thin, being aggrieved because of separation from him. Seeing his wife in that condition, Lord Ramchandra was very compassionate. When Ramchandra came before her, she was exceedingly happy to see her beloved, and her lotus-like mouth showed her joy. After giving the Bishan the power to rule the Rakshasa population of Lanka for the duration of one kalpa, Lord Ramchandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
placed Sita Devi on an airplane decorated with flowers, and then he got on the plane himself. The period for his living in the forest having ended, the Lord returned to Ayodhya, accompanied by Hanuman, Sugriv, and his brother Lakshman. When Lord Ramchandra returned to his capital, Ayodhya, he was greeted on the road by the princely order who showered his body with beautiful, fragrant flowers, while great personalities like Lord Brahma and other demigods glorified the activities of the Lord in great jubilation. Upon reaching Ayodhya, Lord Ramachandra heard that in his absence his brother Bharat was eating barley cooked in the urine of a cow, covering his body with the bark of trees, wearing matted locks of hair, and lying on a mattress of kusha. The most merciful Lord very much lamented this. When Lord Bharat understood that Lord Ramachandra was returning to the capital, Ayodhya, he immediately took upon his own head Lord Ramachandra's wooden shoes and came out from his camp at Nandigram. Lord Bharat was accompanied by ministers, priests, and other respectable citizens, by professional musicians vibrating pleasing musical sounds, and by learned Brahmins loudly chanting Vedic hymns. Following in the procession were chariots drawn by beautiful horses with harnesses of golden rope. These chariots were decorated by flags with golden embroidery and by other flags of various sizes and patterns. There were soldiers bedecked with golden armor, servants bearing betel nut, and many well-known and beautiful prostitutes. Many servants followed on foot, bearing an umbrella, whisks, different grades of precious jewels, and other paraphernalia befitting a royal reception. Accompanied in this way, Lord Bharat, his heart softened in ecstasy and his eyes full of tears, approached Lord Ramachandra and fell at his lotus feet with great ecstatic love. After offering the wooden shoes before Lord Ramachandra, Lord Bharat stood with folded hands, his eyes full of tears, and Lord Ramachandra bathed Bharat with tears while embracing him with both arms for a long time. Accompanied by Mother Sita and Lakshman, Lord Ramachandra then offered his respectful obeisances unto the learned Brahmins and the elderly persons in the family, and all the citizens of Ayodhya offered their respectful obeisances unto the Lord. The citizens of Ayodhya, upon seeing their king return after a long absence, offered him flower garlands, waved their upper cloths, and danced in great jubilation. O King, Lord Bharat carried Lord Ramachandra's wooden shoes. Sugriv and Vibhishan carried a whisk and an excellent fan. Hanuman carried a white umbrella. Shatrugna carried a bow and two quivers. And Sita Devi carried a water pot filled with water from holy places. Angada carried a sword. And Jambavan, king of the rikshas, carried a golden shield. O King Parikshit, as the Lord sat on his airplane of flowers, with offering him prayers and reciters chanting about his characteristics, he appeared like the moon with the stars and planets. Thereafter, having been welcomed by his brother Bharat, Lord Ramachandra entered the city of Ayodhya in the midst of a festival. When he entered the palace, he offered obeisances to all the mothers, including Kaikei and the other wives of Maharaj Dasharath and especially his own mother, Kaushalya. He also offered obeisances to the spiritual preceptors, such as Vasishta. Friends of his own age and younger friends worshipped him, and he returned their respectful obeisances, as did Lakshman and Mother Sita. In this way they all entered the palace. Upon seeing their sons, the mothers of Ram and Lakshman, Bharat and Shatrugan, immediately arose, like unconscious bodies returning to consciousness. The mothers placed their sons on their laps and bathed them with tears, thus relieving themselves of the grief of long separation. The family priest or spiritual master, Vasishta, had Lord Ramchandra cleanly shaved, freeing him from his matted locks of hair. 
Then, with the cooperation of the elderly members of the family, he performed the bathing ceremony, or Abhishek, for Lord Ramachandra with the water of the four seas and with other substances, just as it was performed for King Indra. Lord Ramachandra fully bathed and his head clean-shaven, dressed himself very nicely and was decorated with a garland and ornaments. Thus he shone brightly, surrounded by his brothers and wife, who were similarly dressed and ornamented. Being pleased by the full surrender and submission of Lord Bharat, Lord Ramachandra then accepted the throne of the state. He cared for the citizens exactly like a father, and the citizens, being fully engaged in their occupational duties of Varna and Ashram, accepted him as their father. Lord Ramchandra became king during Treta Yuga, but because of his good government, the age was like Satya Yuga. Everyone was religious and completely happy. O Maharaj Pariksit, best of the Bharat dynasty, during the reign of Lord Ramchandra, the forests, the rivers, the hills and mountains, the states, the seven islands and the seven seas were all favorable in supplying the necessities of life for all living beings. When Lord Ramchandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was the king of this world, all bodily and mental suffering, disease, old age, bereavement, lamentation, distress, fear and fatigue were completely absent. There was even no death for those who did not want it. Lord Ramchandra took a vow to accept only one wife and have no connection with any other women. He was a saintly king, and everything in his character was good, untinged by qualities like anger. He taught good behavior for everyone, especially for householders, in terms of Vanashram Dharma. Thus he taught the general public by his personal activities. Mother Sita was very submissive, faithful, shy, and chaste, always understanding the attitude of her husband. Thus by her character and her love and service, she completely attracted the mind of the Lord. Thus ends the tenth chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Pastimes of the Supreme Lord Ramchandra. And now chapter 11, Lord Ramachandra rules the world. Shukdev Goswami said, Thereafter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramachandra, accepted an acharya and performed sacrifices with opulent paraphernalia. Thus he himself worshipped himself, for he is the Supreme Lord of all demigods. Lord Ramachandra gave the entire East to the Hota priest, the entire South to the Brahma priest, the West to the Advaryu priest, and the North to the Udgata priest, the reciter of the Sam Veda. In this way he donated his kingdom. Thereafter, thinking that because the Brahmins have no material desires, they should possess the entire world, Lord Ramchandra delivered the land between the East, West, North and South to the Acharya. After thus giving everything in charity to the Brahmins, Lord Ramchandra retained only his personal garments and ornaments, and similarly the Queen, Mother Sita, was left with only her nose ring and nothing else. All the Brahmins who were engaged in the various activities of the sacrifice were very pleased with Lord Ramchandra, who was greatly affectionate and favorable to the Brahmins. Thus, with melted hearts, they returned all the property received from him and spoke as follows. O Lord, you are the master of the entire universe. What have you not given us? You have entered the core of our hearts and dissipated the darkness of our ignorance by your effulgence. This is the supreme gift. We do not need a material donation. O Lord, you are the supreme personality of Godhead who have accepted the Brahmins as your worshipable deity. Your knowledge and memory are never disturbed by anxiety. You are the chief of all famous persons within this world and your lotus feet are worshipped by sages who are beyond the jurisdiction of punishment. O Lord Ramchandra, let us offer our respectful obeisances unto you.
Once while Lord Ramchandra was walking at night incognito, hiding himself by a disguise to find out the people's opinion of himself, he heard a man speaking unfavorably about his wife, Sita Devi. Speaking to his unchaste wife, the man said, You go to another man's house, and therefore you are unchaste and polluted. I shall not maintain you any more. A henpecked husband like Lord Ram may accept a wife like Sita, who went to another man's house, but I am not henpecked like him, and therefore I shall not accept you again. Men with a poor fund of knowledge and a heinous character speak nonsensically. Fearing such rascals, Lord Ramchandra abandoned his wife, Sita Devi, although she was pregnant. Thus Sita Devi went to the ashram of Valmiki Muni. When the time came, the pregnant mother Sita Devi gave birth to twin sons, later celebrated as Lava and Kusha. The ritualistic ceremonies for their birth were performed by Valmiki Muni. O Maharaj Pariksit, Lord Lakshman had two sons named Angada and Chitraketu, and Lord Bharat also had two sons named Taksha and Pushkala. Shatrugna had two sons named Subahu and Shrutasena. When Lord Bharat went to conquer all directions, he had to kill many millions of Gandharvas who are generally pretenders. Taking all their wealth, he offered it to Lord Ramchandra. Shatrugna also killed a Rakshasa named Lavana, who was the son of Madhu Rakshasa. Thus he established in the great forest known as Madhuvan, the town known as Mathura. Being forsaken by her husband, Sita Devi entrusted her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni. Thus meditating upon the lotus feet of Lord Ramchandra, she entered into the earth. After hearing the news of Mother Sita's entering the earth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead was certainly aggrieved. Although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, upon remembering the exalted qualities of Mother Sita, he could not check his grief in transcendental love. The attraction between man and woman, or male and female, always exists everywhere, making everyone always fearful. Such feelings are present even among the controllers like Brahma and Lord Shiva, and is the cause of fear for them, what to speak of others who are attached to household life in this material world. After Mother Sita entered the earth, Lord Ramchandra observed complete celibacy and performed an uninterrupted Agnihotra Yagya for 13,000 years. After completing the sacrifice, Lord Ramchandra, whose lotus feet were sometimes pierced by thorns when he lived in Dandakaranya, placed those lotus feet in the hearts of those who always think of him. Then he entered his own abode, the Vaikuntha planet, beyond the Brahmagyoti. Lord Ramchandra's reputation for having killed Ravan with showers of arrows at the request of the demigods, and for having built a bridge over the ocean, does not constitute the factual glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramchandra, whose spiritual body is always engaged in various pastimes. Lord Ramchandra has no equal or superior, and therefore he had no need to take help from the monkeys to gain victory over Ravan. Lord Ramachandra's spotless name and fame, which vanquish all sinful reactions, are celebrated in all directions, like the ornamental cloth of the victorious elephant that conquers all directions. Great saintly persons like Mark and Dea Rishi still glorify his characteristics in the assemblies of great emperors like Maharaj Yudhishthir. Similarly, all the saintly kings and all the demigods, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, worship the Lord by bowing down with their helmets. Let me offer my obeisances unto his lotus feet. Lord Ramachandra returned to his abode, to which bhakti yogis are promoted. This is the place to which all the inhabitants of Ayodhya went after they served the Lord in his manifest pastimes by offering him obeisances, touching his lotus feet, fully observing him as a father-like king, sitting or lying down with him like equals, or even just accompanying him. O King Pariksit, 
Anyone who orally receives the narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes will ultimately be freed from the disease of envy and thus be liberated from the bondage of fruitive activities. How did the Lord conduct himself and how did he behave in relationship with his brothers who were expansions of his own self? And how did his brothers and the inhabitants of Ayodhya treat him? After accepting the throne of the government by the fervent request of his younger brother Bharat, Lord Ramachandra ordered his younger brothers to go out and conquer the entire world, while he personally remained in the capital to give audience to all the citizens and residents of the palace and supervise the governmental affairs with his other assistants. During the reign of Lord Ramchandra, the streets of the capital, Ayodhya, were sprinkled with perfumed water and drops of perfumed liquor, thrown about by elephants from their trunks. When the citizens saw the Lord personally supervising the affairs of the city in such opulence, they appreciated this opulence very much. The palaces, the palace gates, the assembly houses, the platforms for meeting places, the temples and all such places were decorated with golden water pots and bedecked with various types of flags. Wherever Lord Ramchandra visited, auspicious welcome gates were constructed with banana trees and betel nut trees full of flowers and fruits. The gates were decorated with various flags made of colorful cloth and with tapestries, mirrors and garlands. Wherever Lord Ramchandra visited, the people approached him with paraphernalia of worship and begged the Lord's blessings. O oh Lord, they said, as you rescued the earth from the bottom of the sea in your incarnation as a boar, may you now maintain it. Thus we beg your blessings. Thereafter, not having seen the Lord for a long time, the citizens, both men and women, being very eager to see him, left their homes and got up on the roofs of the palaces. Being incompletely satiated with seeing the face of the lotus-eyed Lord Ramchandra, they showered flowers upon him. Thereafter, Lord Ramchandra entered the palace of his forefathers. Within the palace were various treasures and valuable wardrobes. The sitting places on the two sides of the entrance door were made of coral. The yards were surrounded by pillars of Vaidurya money. The floor was made of highly polished Marakata money, and the foundation was made of marble. The entire palace was decorated with flags and garlands and bedecked with valuable stones shining with a celestial effulgence. The palace was fully decorated with pearls and surrounded by lamps and incense. The men and women within the palace all resembled demigods and were decorated with various ornaments which seemed beautiful because of being placed on their bodies. Lord Ramachandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, chief of the best learned scholars, resided in that place with his pleasure potency, Mother Sita, and enjoyed complete peace. Without transgressing the religious principles, Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet are worshipped by devotees in meditation, enjoyed with all the paraphernalia of transcendental pleasure for as long as needed. Thus ends the eleventh chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Lord Ramachandra Rules the World.